Black Rifle Podcast starts now. Having a uh, prosthetic leg issue going on here. Mm. Is your leg not you working? I just right got to make sure that it's the right height. Got it. Otherwise, my leg falls off. This is like it's all funny like games. A, it's it's all funny games until your <laughs> leg, leg falls, falls off. off. Yeah, <laughs> I've said it on the floor a couple of times. <laughs> You gotta stop. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, it's all fun and games until your leg falls off. That's right, man. If yeah. I go to a bar, I don't sit in the tall stools because they gotta be just the right height. Ask me how I found out, right? <laughs> <laughs> does it does it make I guess uh, other people on the floor, do they make it does, do you and having a prosthetic in your background, does it make them feel uncomfortable? Sometimes. Yeah. But depending on the person, I use that to my advantage and I press the issue. Right. Uh, a lot of times I'll make fun of my background. You know, some of my physical you know, the things I've been through. Yeah. But, uh, you know, just to get to a point to open it up and show them, look, anything's on the table. Let's talk. Let's mm-hmm. get through it. But, yeah, no, it, it does. They don't, <laughs> they don't want to know what to do. They don't want to look at it. They don't want to offend me. I'm like, guys, the Army broke my feelings a long time yeah, ago. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Right. We're good. It's so interesting because when you think about all the great things that the military has done for us, yep. well, which is a, la- a laundry mm-hmm. list, but, but most people don't understand especially guys from our community when they come from the, the soft community mm-hmm. like what, what i tell people is like dude i was raised by wolves like inside a team room is the most politically incorrect place that you could spend time like right. it's it's not it, it's not meant for general consumption especially when you when you think back of the things that you're doing and you're putting bullets in people for a living that's right and then when you try to transition back into civilian world and you think that this is going to be easy, one. And two, people are going to, they'll, uh, they'll, uh, what's the word? I thought I was being, like, when I transitioned out, it's like, man, I thought I was, I'm, I was really politically correct and professional. Other yeah. people were like, what in the, f- you, you, the way that you make words is scary. <laughs> yes. So when I jumped into the nonprofit sector, there were yeah. a lot. And we're not recording yet, right? We so, are. Uh, what? Yeah, we're recording, dude. <laughs> yeah. That's how I start this thing. Good. Yeah. So in the nonprofit sector, there's a different breed of people, right? There are military folks. There are people that, uh, you know, come from a different background, right. maybe a little softer than we're used to, right, is mm-hmm. the way I'd put it. And then you jump in, and you're dropping the F-bomb as a verb, a noun, yeah, an adjective, yeah. an adverb. Yeah. And people are like, you can't do that. You, you, we don't. We don't talk that way. Right. We don't think that way. And uh, yeah, no, it's very real. And jumping into the political side of this, it's even more so. I think sometimes they still feel like, uh, you know, someone crawled up over the wall, and we have uh, enemy in the uh, inside the wire here. Right. They don't know what to make of it. But that's why I really am mindful of how we talk, what I do, and how I say, and I use those moments for our benefit mm-hmm. to really push that message home, to open it up. In the end, if we really want to change things, you got to be present, right? More than anything else, nothing changes. You can't change a game till you win the game. You got to be on the field. So we're here. Many of us are trying to do it, but you got to pick those times. And it's hard when you transition because you don't have the language, the lexicon. Yeah, it's it's a thing. Wait, what year did you retire? Uh, five years ago. Okay. And then how many years did you do? Uh, Twenty three. Twenty three. So yeah, give us give us your give us your bio, man. Spend as much time as you want on it. Oh, wow. My bio. So, yeah, I joined uh, the Army in 1996. Solid. I was yeah. in 95. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Solid, solid. Came out of northeastern Montana. Uh, you know, where I grew up looks a lot like this table. It's flat and brown. Right. Uh, I was adopted by my grandparents. Uh, definitely not a silver spoon. Uh, they were farmers. Uh, right. My family lost our farm growing up. Uh, coming out of the 80s, the Carter years were not awesome. Mm-hmm. Interest rates and a lot of things were going wrong. And, right. you know, they sold the farm, made a decision. And it really changed the future uh, of my world and my life. And, you know, went to college for a couple of years, thought I was going to be an NFL superstar, came to a stark realization that was not, in fact, going to happen. Uh, Where'd ACL. you go to school? Uh, a couple of places. Uh, signed on to go to Mizzou. Uh, yeah. Ended up going to Minot State. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, once you wreck your knee, man, you're, you're done. Yeah. Astro turf. What's back. Mizzou? Missouri. Oh, okay. 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 All right, and I was then, thinking uh, Missoula. No, but no. No. <laughs> no, it's funny, man. I only the only schools that recruited me out of Montana were like smaller schools, like Carroll right. College and people like that. Yeah, uh, Bozeman, Missoula, you know, U of M and MSU. Not a single letter, not even a conversation. Wow. But I was talking to big one A universities yeah. at the time. Anyway, it is what it is, right? Yeah. I went to school for a couple of years, and then uh, I joined the army. I thought I would join for four years, and uh, 
you know, I always wanted What'd to What'd you join it. up as? So here's the funny thing. I was an 11 Bravo in the guard. The guard yeah. kicked me out because I was broken. They're like, you tore your ACL, your MCL, you cracked your kneecap, you're done. Right. Boom, you're out of here. So they kicked me out, right? And I joined the Army, and they're like, well, we need you. You scored pretty good. Yeah. We can put you in intelligence, in the medical field, or you can do, like, this admin thing. I envisioned James Bond. That yeah. was not what I did. I became a uh, 96 Bravo at the time, an all-source analyst. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. Okay. I was a square peg in a round hole. Yeah. I had a 400 PT score, and the next highest was like a 260. Right. Not doing the same things. But what I found out is this was really the best place for me to learn just the big picture of the, you know, the inner workings of the government, how things matter, how joint targeting works, mm-hmm. how, you know, how we profile things, right? And to understand that big picture... So after uh, I joined the Army, I uh, went to Korea, did that for a year and change, left Korea, went to Fort Carson, Colorado, and then I went off to the United Kingdom. I went to RAF Molesworth in the UK. Interesting. Yeah, it was a crazy place, right? Yeah. And uh, it was there that uh, I, I started to see the big picture. We were working, you know, things that flew, SIGIN and Immense and all of that. And pre-9-11, mm-hmm. we were starting to solve some really complicated problems and uh, went off to uh, Beanock. You know, it was going to be a, a big E6. Oh, yeah. And I met my wife. We ran out to Vegas. At Beanock? At Beanock. She was, was at she... Intel. Oh, she was a counter gotcha. Intel okay, agent. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And we both ended up at Fort Huachuca together. Yeah. And we started dating and big groups hanging out. Right. Got smaller, smaller, smaller. And pretty soon, we ran out to Vegas. And, uh, you know, still married now. Two awesome right. little boys. They're 8, 11, and 8. And, uh, you know, we applied for the Army's Joint Married Couples Program. It's like the Pirate's Code, Right. It's kind of an ish, yeah. whether they work or not. So in true what, DoD, what is that? What, what's so the Joint the, Married Couples Program? Yeah, yeah. So this is the program where your branch or my branch and her yeah. branch work together to right. put you in a p- position to live together, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. they got to have you close right. enough to each yeah. other to uh-huh. fit the regulations. And uh, you would expect that they would move us to you know one to the other. But in DoD fashion, they said, let's double down our cost and we'll move you to Fort Bragg. Mm-hmm. I went to the first of the 325. And uh, she went over to 7th Special Forces Group. Uh, so I was in jump school for 9-11, and uh, really that's where our whole world started to shift. Right. You know, September 10th, I did my first jump. September 11th, we flew around for hours. Didn't know the towers had been hit until hours afterwards. Hours. Yeah, she was living in D.C. at the time before she got forced down to uh, Fort Bragg uh, for this joint married couples order system. And, uh, you know, uh, we thought war was going to happen. It would be fast and be quick. We'd be in and out in a year. That was our expectation. Yeah. In no way, shape, or form do we expect it to be two decades mm-hmm. right, of our life. And really an entire generation of military people, that their whole world was fabricated around that. Right. So, you know, we got there, graduated, and I came to Tampa and then a couple other places through there to go work with a joint interagency task force. It was a tasker. And I saw SF guys and right. the tiers and the agencies all right. working together. And I was like, holy crap, man, that is awesome. That's what I thought I was signing up for. Right. So wrapped up that little, uh, you know, sort of deployment and went to selection like two weeks afterwards, and the rest was just volunteering for new things. So what year did you go to uh, Special Forces Assessment and Selection? 02. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I went in November 02, the ice storm class. Uh, right. Trees oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very real. Well, there's a, there's a uh, like, I think the ice storm class, and then there's like an infamous... Uh, long walk class around that same time where yep. it, there was only like five guys that, right. that graduated. <clears throat> one of my buddies was one of those dudes. Oh, that's awesome! And uh, uh, he was subsequently like a few years ago. He was he was killed in a parachuting accident or he, on the way down. His name was Chris Nelms. He's an amazing guy. Um, but that ice storm is like yeah, very infamous. I was in um uh. Was it, what was it? What was the name of that that advanced hostage seer, fucking special forces seer that we, you, we would do urban survival, whatever? Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah, I was in that. that okay, one. in O two. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, because I was. Uh, what was your MLS? I was a uh, eighteen Delta. Oh, okay. You're and then a Zulu. Guy. Well, I don't know if I was smart or not. That's what <laughs> put me. But, uh, <laughs> I took the longer path, eighteen <laughs> yeah. Delta. But uh, it was my last choice. Right, I put yeah. uh, Bravo Charlie Echo Delta. Really? They're like, well, you want to be a Green Beret? Yes, sir. I very yeah. much would like to be a Green Beret. Yeah. Well, you're going to be an 18 Delta. I don't want to be an 18 Delta. I want to be a Bravo. You're not listening. <laughs> would you like to be a Green Beret? Picking up what you're laying down now. I'm happy to do it. And went off the Delta course. Uh, got all the way through. And uh, 
yeah, I did a little bit of retraining there. I had to reblew my skills on one thing, and then right. went through and ended up at Seven Special Forces Group, uh, which was pretty awesome. Uh, first battalion, you know, doing. What something. year were you assigned there? Got there in 05. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Yeah, 05, and then left there in 09. Mm. Uh, went to SWIFT to pay my penance. Yeah. You know, you got to do what you got to do. Did you go back to the 18 Delta? I did. Like, did you? Yeah. Worked yeah. lanes for about a year, and then I volunteered for another organization on Fort Bragg. Right. And uh, went to selection a couple times. Uh, ended up going there, and it, that's where we started figuring out all the issues with my leg and my back. You know, I'd been hit by a mortar in 07. I also got shot in 07. Yeah. Uh, took a ricochet, ended up doing a fasciotomy on myself. Great barroom story. Yeah, I've, I, we, we, we've got to get into this. Yeah. Like, like, So uh, I don't want to fast forward through this because this is like this yeah, we'll, is we'll a crazy story. So we, we've, we've got to like come back to this fasciotomy story because this is fucking wild. Yeah. Well, it's opportunity, right? Uh, you, it's better than having it's a hook. It's opportunity. <laughs> That's right. It's time to train, bro. <laughs> but uh, we did that. It did a couple other su- subsequent yeah. surgeries afterwards and came back, uh, ate a mortar, fell uh, about 20 feet, jacked up my back, blew out some yeah, discs. Yeah, so what, what, happened, what, what happened there? So you ate a mortar, but you fell 20 feet? Where so you, where, it's an where, inside stairwell. So yeah, the building's oh, like this. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. And you crest up it, and yeah. the mortar hits... You come down. I got peppered right. with shrapnel. You know, honestly, I didn't think it was that big a deal. Really? I, I really thought that I had just probably, had, at worst case, bruised some things, b- maybe broken some bones in my T spine yeah. when I landed like that. Had no idea how bad it was. But uh, I got up, man. I was just peppered with shrapnel. My leg wasn't ripped off. And I, you uh, fell twenty feet. About twenty feet. Yeah, I hit some things. Would you way down. land? Would you land on my back? Like your back body armor. Yeah, like a turtle. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Right. Not not so awesome. No, it really wasn't. But no. in retrospect, it okay, the, I I feel like nine feet off a off a off a fucking wall one time, yeah. and landed on my back. Very similar, especially when you're wearing shit, and yep. had a little camel back on the back, which I was like, you know, broke my fall or whatever you want to call it. But twenty fucking feet. Well, like, and it's in in retros if, if, in retrospect, if you look at it. The body armor was a little heavy, so yeah. there was some pad built in here, there. Yeah. My feet probably drug, slowed me down a little bit. Oh, right, right. And it, it shifted me as I came down, so the full force wasn't there. But as you looked at it, my feet kicked over and ended up blowing out my lower lumbar spine, like L2, L3, What L4, does that L5, mean when you say one. blow it out? Like, uh, So if you look at the discs as a like a donut, uh-huh. right, you should have the disc space all neat and clean, all the jelly inside it. Yeah. But my jelly was not outside it. It was oh, everywhere. It was right. a mess. And... Uh, yeah. So what do they do for that? Like, like well, if I wasn't, uh, and we got to hold ourselves accountable, right? Yeah. That's one of the biggest issues in our country. People aren't held accountable. Uh, part of this is my fault. We are who we are, right? right. I didn't want to quit. Yeah. I got up. I had a headache. I knew what had happened, and you just keep fighting. I mean, they were trying to overrun our fire base. For the love right. of God, what do you do? You get up and you shoot people and you fight. Where Where was this at? Anaconda Fire Base, yeah. Anaconda. Yeah, up in Cos is gone. And uh, you know, who's the team leader there? The team leader was um, Martin. Okay. Was yeah. his last name. Um, and I was like, the acting team sergeant. Right. Our other guy had gotten injured, been sick. So right. I was a senior medic and the team sergeant. Like, I'm not going to lay on the ground. It's right. Like, got a team get to shit take to care do. Of, right? Yeah. So you get up and you fight. And I figured if I could do that, it was all fine. So I didn't really get checked out. Right. You know, you check, you plug up the holes, you do the reporting, and you just continue Keep going. On. So about a year later, I'm. My foot's dragging behind me. I've already PCS to SWIC. I've got like functional nerve damage, and I'm just, I'm not quitting. I'm still running, jumping, rucking. Your foot's dragging, and you're still like, and you're at 18 Delta. And you're. That's why this is hard <laughs> question. Like, what are you doing, <laughs> my man? Super, my super skill is that I don't yeah. quit. And yeah. I'm a, I'm a tad relentless, perhaps. Oh, right. But I had a goal, man. Yeah. I wanted to get to that next thing. I didn't mm. want to be an instructor. And I've got this pain. All this is going on. And I'm like, nope, it doesn't matter. Right. This is just part of life, man. That's the buy-in. And then, you know, I went to selection. Didn't work out the first time. Went again. Uh, got to go down there. Uh, was going to do it uh, as a medic. And I talked to the physician assistant and the physical therapist. And they're looking at my leg. And they're like, what is wrong with your leg, man? What was going on with it? Was it, was so, it, was it atrophying? It, it or, was. I had oh. three inches of atrophy in the quad and hamstring and about the same in the calf. I had no nerve function, so reflexes, they're not reflexing. So, yeah, it's kind of a big deal. There's a hard line between, or there, there's, a, there's a soft line sometimes between hard and retard, right? 
There's like a... That's a that smart comment from earlier. <laughs> That's why I said I got to hold myself accountable. Like... You know, but back then, man, if you said you were good and you could get up and perform, yeah, people let you perform, right? right? And I was still holding my own. I was Dude. able to stay qualified, jump out of airplanes, free fall, maintain my PT score. I just went through dramatic levels of pain uh, in that process. So then I show up there... And they're like, wow, this is really bad. So they fly me to Walter Reed. Yeah. We do emergency back surgery to kind of aug out all yeah. the space. And they thought, okay, this is an autom- autonomic nervous system issue. Right. By doing this and cleaning it up, getting the pressure off the nerves, you'll be fine in a year. Mm. No, we did that. So I did odd jobs, helped out, did the things we needed to do, got healthy, and I kind of peaked. But there were other issues is the, the problem. When you're a hammer, you know, the whole yeah. world's a nail. So yeah. they were, everyone was so hyper-focused, and partly my fault again, on the nervous system issues in the fall that they didn't really check the vascularity or the lymphatic function. It turns out that I had no lymph function in my left leg. From what? From the fall. From the the fall. So we figure that the blast propagation, you mean, you know how blast theory works. I probably ate a substantial amount of that uh, up on my leg. And and when I fell, this compounded it. Mm. And... Well, I think, I have, but but I think you should explain what that means because I think there's a huge percentage of people that don't know what that is. And well, I appreciate it. So when you watch a movie, mm-hmm. there's a big ball, right, of orange fluff, right? Uh, blasts go like this, and the sheer force of that, I was probably 25 feet away from the explosion when it happened, and I ate a lot of that pressure and that overpressure on my leg, and uh, it turns out I found out through a hearing test where they blow air in your ear yeah. that it had also perforated my inner ear. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was a doozy, man. They blew air in there, and the whole world started spinning for about five hours. I couldn't even stand. Seriously? L- l- seriously. What? I laid down on the floor and was like... <laughs> and how how long after? Oh, my God. This was six years after, seven years after. And you hadn't I had noticed? scar tissue built. No. I, oh, interesting. Yeah. You know, you yeah. at that point, man, everything hurts. But, but even, like, going to... I'm just wondering, like, you know, you're going to altitude... You know, you're doing, you know, hey ho, hey low. Yeah. Are you, are you dive qualified too? Mm, I am not. Okay. So that would have been a, di- yeah, that would that have been probably a would have manifested deal breaker. in retrospect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So I do remember times when I would cough spasmatically. Uh huh. And I thought, you know, this, this happens. It happened before. So you brush it off because I was able to get through it. And it was just the sheer grace of God, man, uh, essentially, that I probably had, you know, passed a clot or things like yeah. that had to come through my lungs. No and way. Was coughing. So the coughing that you're you're doing from like spasmatically, that's right. You're passing a clot, more than likely. Holy shit! Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's that whole smart thing, right? Again, yeah. hold myself accountable. Um, we're our own worst enemies, but you select and train us specifically for those traits right. to overcome, adapt, and keep moving. Yeah. So why would I quit? And you keep going through that. Mm-hmm. So finally, <clears throat> I get to go to this this training course. Uh, you know, it's about six months long, yeah. and I'm just not performing, man. The pain is still there. It's probably at this time a three or five out of ten most days. Like it's yeah. just it's just burning, pulsing pain in my leg. It, it's consistent. It's constant. But then you have these explosions of uh, neuropathic pain. It just takes your breath away. It right. would happen in the middle of the night, and I'd have cramping or this explosion of pain. And it, you can't function. I mean, my whole world would shift. So when you're doing a bunch of CQB things like yeah, that. Yeah. Every little thing matters, and I was just not meeting it. I remember we're going through and we're climbing a building, and I got stuck on the side of a building because my leg wouldn't work anymore. I couldn't push off my leg. My other leg was so fatigued, so there I am stuck. I mean, it's horrifying and embarrassing, and that was where, you know, again, you right. know, a smart thing. I, I, I'm accountable, frankly, and uh, I put myself there. Now, the medical system missed some things as well. Mm-hmm. But I was still performing at right. a high, high, high level. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that was where things got real. Came from there, and they kind of pulled me out of training. They were like, what is going on? we got to figure this out. And we did a bunch of medical tests, evaluations, and it led us to the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic actually ended up figuring out what was going on because they looked at it differently. They took a holistic look at all the things that weren't working in my body, right, Uh, from my leg to my back, the nervous system, and what they came up with was essentially I ate a mortar. Right. Uh, overpressure caused issues. I had lymphatic function issues, so all the garbage your body produces yeah. wasn't pooling up. So my leg, at the end of the day, would swell up like this. I was wearing 120 milligrams of mercury medical hose. That's about three of the average ones you buy at Walmart on my leg just to keep it skinny enough to stay what? in the boot. Dead serious. Every day that way. 
I was just stacking these things, right. and especially making them. So that's going on. Then I had vascular compromise. So every pump of blood, it was pooling in my leg. Yeah. And it would regurgitate there. So cap refill should be relatively yeah. quick. Mine was about five seconds. So all kinds of issues going on. By this point, we're six years after coming up on seven. Yeah. The hair's falling out. The toenails have fallen out. My leg's essentially blue. And I can't walk. I'm at a brace called the IDEO. I'm trying to operate. So I'm trying to fast rope in this yeah. thing. I'm trying to skydive and do all those things that we, we were trying to do. And I'm trying to just find a way, a path ahead of me. And they were breaking, man. I remember a dude cut me off coming in for final. And it was about, I don't know, 400 feet. Collapsed my chute partially, so I sped up dramatically. Yeah. Chute popped, and I came <clears> in, and this brace hit because I'm left leg dominant, right. and it exploded. Like struts went one way, carbon fiber went the other, and I did an endo on the drop zone because I couldn't control my leg without it. Right. And there I was. And, you know, finally, command did what they should do, right? They were like, you're going to kill yourself or somebody else. we got to look out for your best interest. And wasn't what I wanted to hear, but it put me on the path to have that chance to requalify and to finally learn a lesson, mm -hmm. right? Like, you got to take a knee sometimes. Right. If you are so hard broke that you can't do this, there's a time when leadership has to step in, and that's what we did. That's yeah. what they did. And it wasn't what I wanted, uh, but in the end, it led us to the path. So they amputated my leg in January 14 at the Mayo Clinic. Went off to Walter Reed for rehab, and I ended up uh, having the opportunity to requalify about a year and a half, a year and two months, three months, I guess, a year and a quarter later, as a Green Beret. So I redid every single thing we'd ever done from the PT test, static line jump, free fall jump, wall lockers, UBRR, anything that they could do. Was I was so old in my career. I was right. like 18 years. Yeah. You know, I was the anomaly. Most people are six, seven years at the most. Right. So I show up and they're like, dude, you're just going to get, you're done. Yeah, you're you, done. You can't do this. Right. I just wanted the opportunity. And it's a funny story. It was myself and a few other folks, like Nick Lavery was in Walter Reed mm -hmm. at the same time as me, uh, Big Nick. And he's out there just killing it. That dude is a mutant. One of the best Green Berets I've ever met as far right. as just the tenacity to get stuff done. And uh, I'm over there doing box jumps, just slaying it, killing it, right? Ripping it up. I'm an old man uh, in their eyes. And Mid thirties, right? Yeah, <laughs> old man, <laughs> mid thirties, right? And I was like, dude, you're, yeah. you're, you're crusty. And I turn around. You know how it feels when someone huge walks up behind you? Yeah, like, you can was, feel like a shadow. That's like, right. Yeah, you're you're so in like, their Ooh, shadow. Yeah. Mufasa, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's General Odierno, and a walks big, up, big dude. He is. And yeah. I, I, I like walk down. I put my leg on, and I, I get myself straight because right. it's kind of a big deal at the time. Yeah. And he's like, "What is your deal, man? Like, you're different than the others. I've got like sweat everywhere. I'm just mm -hmm. absolutely disgusting. I probably smelled like three dead things stacked up on each other." And uh, I said, "Look, I'm a Green Beret. This is my background. These are the things I've done, and I want to requalify. I want the opportunity." That dude actually did it. He called the sergeant major of the army. Did he really? The sergeant major of the army called my entire chain of command. He called the officer side, and then people called me. Like, what did you do? I told him I wanted to have a chance to stay yeah. in. They actually followed through. So that man is all aces in my book wow. because he did exactly what he said. All I wanted was the opportunity, yeah. man. Opportunity and outcome aren't the same thing. Mm -hmm. Just let me say, see if I can or I can't. But if I fail to try and I self-select on this, Somebody else is going to have to prove it can be done after me. Right. And if not me, then who, right? It's right. that simple. So uh, I asked for it. I got it. Spent about five years in after that. Uh, unfortunately, not on a team. Uh, yeah. It wasn't the way my career was. Um, I was old enough that I got put in charge of things. So I was right. there at the OSW as we kind of brought that up and started solving complex problems. That's where I worked with a few of your old folks. Right. Uh, in different agencies. And then uh, ended up in another program, very closely connected to what you used to do. And from there, I closed it out uh, running the 18 Delta Committee at SWIC because I thought it was value added right. to have a one-legged dude come in fully qualified and you know share the resiliency of what you had learned. Uh, was fully qualified to deploy, and unfortunately, it was just a different phase of, uh, of combat and operations. Mm -hmm. And would love to have. It just didn't, uh, that part didn't open up. But did five years-ish, five, five and a half years afterwards and retired about five years ago now. Yeah. Stepped into the nonprofit sector where uh, we feed people barbecue mm -hmm. after natural disasters. Right. Up to 100,000 hot meals a day for up to 30 days. So it's, what, it's, what's the name of the nonprofit? So it's Operation Barbecue Relief. Yeah. OBR.org. Mm -hmm. It's a nonprofit that uh, is based out of uh, Missouri. Works in any, any state. But we also give back to veterans, military, mm -hmm. first responders, and their families. We just bought a camp mm -hmm. in Lake of the Ozarks 
that will open up this summer called Camp OBR, where we're going to do what we call culinary therapy. Right. You know, if you look at our nation, the biggest gap is the people, right? Mm -hmm. There's some issues with understanding and information. I believe the breakdown in our country really comes from the breakdown of the American family and value structure. Right. So how do you solve it? I would posit that over br over bread, over dinner, breaking mm -hmm. bread is a way to do it. So we do culinary therapy. Right. We're going to have hunting, boating, fishing, all of that cool stuff. But we're also going to sit down with you know grill masters and chefs, some really amazing people. And uh, we're going to teach them how to grill and cook with their families. We're going to build networks longitudinally across the country. So... It'd be pretty, pretty awesome once we kick off. We've done a couple of test camps, extremely well received. Right. But what we want to do is empower them. I believe the biggest differentiator in a good transition and bad is purpose. When you have purpose, everything matters. Everything mm -hmm. is vital and alive. And you know, it's like being in Afghanistan. Every little piece of rock could be an IED. It matters, right? Mm -hmm. So you pay attention. When you have purpose, that's what you wake up for. That's what you serve. And as a sub note, I think we, we overcomplicate that sometimes mm -hmm. as veterans. You know, we talked about it earlier. Am I going to be able to transfer my skills? Are they going to matter? Are they not going to matter? Right. And the truth is, absolutely. Functional intelligence, moral compass, and the ability to come together with people from unique backgrounds, that's what we do all day, every day. It absolutely matters. Mm. What did you fight for? What did you serve for? Those same things are your purpose. I want there for my family to protect my country, to do things that I believed in, those resolute truths. It's the same thing here. It's just a re-manifestation of it. So we do that through barbecue. And OBR uh, allowed me to do some pretty cool things. They didn't bulk. I got to brag about Stan Hayes and Will Cleaver on this. They're the guys who founded this. I was uh, the second employee after the CEO to come in. I said, guys, if we're going to build these nonprofit, these nonprofit programs for veterans, I want to launch with something cool. Don't kick me out of the room, please. Mm -hmm. I want to run a bike across the country from the West Coast to the East Coast, and I want to feed people barbecue like Johnny Appleseed with brisket. Right. Yeah, yeah. You're like, you sure you want to do that? Oh, Absolutely. Cool. So yeah. we did it. 3,000 miles in 50 days. We called it the Breaking Bread Tour. And, uh, yeah, it was, a, it, was, it was pretty awesome. Well, and that, that's super cool. I, I was just listening to, to – um, I forget exactly the podcast I was listening to. Is if They were talking about how – uh, one of the guys that actually deconflicted the Bloods and the Crips relationship, what we call it relationship or conflict, however we want to like phrase it, in the 80s, was he threw a barbecue mm -hmm. and then brought both sides together. Right. And initially it was like very uh, hostile. There's a, there's a significant amount of negative information for, like going back and forth. And then pretty soon they got to talking. And they, they deconstructed barriers. They started to empathize with one another, realized they, they had a ton of things in common. Um, I, I, I wish I could remember where, where that was, but you know, I thought it was like really interesting because yep. it is like this, this, you know, food is this bind, binding element. And it can be so powerful as far as being, well, That's one, right. it's so powerful in the family. You know, I think about it just from, you know, my family's perspective. My wife and kids, like, I don't miss dinner time, right? Like, That's right. like if I'm home, I don't miss dinner. I, yep. I, I don't miss dinner. I don't miss the opportunity to, like, sit down, connect with my kids. I don't miss breakfast if the kids are there. Like, I don't miss these times because these are the times where we're, like, we can make something. That's right. Which is, I, I truly believe, like, having purpose and then being creative and creation is like uh, it, it's it's acting within what I would what I would say is the true definition of of um uh if 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 you so believe in god absolutely where if, if it's the true definition of creator right so you're you're actually emphasizing the belief in god or your spiritual belief is by being a creator the small things really do make a difference so if you're creating a small meal for your family that's a really emotional activity it that is. you can use as a binding element which is creation in the sense of like a cup of coffee. That's right. You're still making. If you're a maker, you're a creator. I think it's so fucking cool and powerful for people to do. So I love that. That's yeah. cool. No, Operation. It, barbecue Relief. Yeah, that is cool. OBR.org is the website. And uh, man, it, it's just cool. But you look at what our background is, right? We broke bread with people we knew, people we didn't know, every culture, every community, every country. Yeah. It's the same, man. Yeah. I mean, you go to my, my wife's family are Lebanese. 
They immigrated from the Shuf Mountains in Lebanon, mm-hmm. and everything is like my big fat Greek wedding on steroids. <laughs> I love her family. They're Your just big amazing. fat Lebanese wedding. It is, yeah, right? Yeah. It's just this big have you ex- been to Lebanon? I have not. Oh, so, man. You know, when COVID kicked off, we yeah. were talking about traveling over there, taking yeah. the family. It's something we're going to do. Yeah. You know, as time li- lines up, but like most of us, I have a bad habit of filling up my calendar space a yeah. lot and just doing a lot of things at once. And uh, we'll get there. We'll get there yeah. soon. But, uh, yeah, man, OBR was pretty cool. It launched me into this, and uh, we just started doing different Wait, things. So where's the best barbecue in uh, Tampa, dude? Like, where's the best barbecue in Tampa? The best barbecue in Tampa. You know, I got to Give be me honest. two spots, three spots. If you got three, who cares? So I like Four Rivers. It's a local guy, John Rivers. Uh-huh. Comes from the restaurant world. Uh, awesome. Good barbecue yeah. across the board. Uh, the brisket shop downtown brisket shop the brisket okay. shop is, yeah, yeah. is pretty legit and then uh I mean, i'm gonna throw a shout out to johnny i and brian maraska from our team yeah that's where you need to come you need to come really? see us those dudes are on point so johnny's a uh he's a fantastic chef right he is he's a james beard awardee brian maraska used to run uh the, the pits for sunny what, what, what awardee what'd you say uh, james beard what is that the beard award it's yeah. it's a it's a it's like a michelin star essentially oh, okay. it's a big deal in the in the food arena they're absolutely amazing. So if you come to Tampa, yeah. you all need to hit me up. We'll throw it down proper. We'll get our guys together and uh, we'll break bread. What do you What do you use? Like, what's your What's your Do you use a smoker? Do you use We like, do. What do you so, use? All the above, right? So yeah. during disaster, this is like a field kitchen on steroids. When you uh, let's talk about Hurricane Ian, we did nine hundred thousand meals. We had a footprint the size of about four football fields. Two hundred fifty volunteers a day. Uh, it's a logistics problem. Mm. So we have giant smokers. It's an E-L-E-D-X. Through E-L-E-D-X? Old, through Old Hickory is the brand. Okay. It's about 2,000 servings of protein every time. We had 2,000 in one smoker? In one smoker. And we had 16 or 17 of those lined up. How much meat is that? Things. Like, what we are you do- doing? Are you doing like three? Semi-trucks of food yeah. every day at that point. Okay. Yeah, two or three semi-trucks were coming in and out every single day. We do lunch and dinner at this. Yeah. So we're doing brisket and pulled pork, chicken, turkey, sausage. You know, this is, this is good food, but mm-hmm. it's comfort food, man. When you lose your home and you're going through all of these things, comfort food matters, right? Yeah. You know, I've done cool things in, in, uh, in the military, things that I would, you know, that I'm eternally grateful for. Mm-hmm. Met amazing people. But, you know, almost at that level and in certain circumstances, even more so, going out to a disaster site where they've lost every single thing they have, everything. And they're laying there and everything they own is out in their yard right. or it's in the water behind their home or whatever. And you walk over there and you're handing out food and they sit there and thank you and they open up. That's pretty cathartic, man. You want to talk about purpose? Right. That's why we have our nonprofit programs. We invite people to come volunteer with us. Because it provides you purpose to lead and make a difference and serve our community and country in a new way. When you lift people up through one hot meal, you want to do it again and again and again and again. It makes a huge difference. And it, it, it changes things fundamentally. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times, like when I was injured, you know, we talked about this at Walter Reed a lot. People show up and they give you things, you know, houses, cars, toys. It's thing after thing after thing, and they never give you the tools mm. or a way to re-manifest your purpose, and it took time for them to understand why we were having suicide issues. People want to matter. They want to make a mm. difference. They don't want everything given to them. Yeah. Our guys are predicated for service over self to make a difference. They joined the military to do that. When you harness that and you let them go do that, man, it's pretty amazing to see. And uh, yeah, so we still do that. I'm the, I run our programs and operations across the country, and uh, disaster, non-disaster, it's, uh, it's a blessing. I'm so grateful those things ended up in my life. And then I decided to jump into politics, <laughs> which is... Uh, we'll get into that. That's a whole thing. <laughs> we'll get into that. That's Wait. a whole other world, but... Uh, so you... We got to go back. Like, you were shot... What year? What year were you shot? 07. 07? Yep. Seven years after is when we cut my leg off. Yeah. For those doing uh, math at home. Right. So where were you shot? Uh, in the arm. Okay. I was uh, on uh, And then you performed surgery on yourself. So I you did. Got, you so, also have to tell that story. Yeah, so, so I, need, in, I need two stories <laughs> you have to tell. You, where you shot, and then also, why yeah. did you do surgery so, on yourself? It's a convoy, right? Yeah. We're here. They're surrounding us. This is back in 07. It was a wild west, man. Everybody, 
it, it was just it was a Iraq lot of or money. Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Yeah. Cost war is gone up in the mm-hmm. mountains of Afghanistan. Firebase Anaconda. They hit the front and the back of the convoy simultaneously. Right. This was the first time that we really had people who moved. Yeah. Differently. Up until then, it had been spray and pray. You know, mm-hmm. farmers with guns. Yep. Uh, being paid by the mm-hmm. Taliban. These guys were shooting, moving, communicating. I can vividly remember, you know, getting on the horn like. These guys are covering each other while they fire. They're communicating laterally across a battlefield. This is state. It's different. Yeah. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. the volley of fire is very real. Yeah. Like I've got rounds popping between my leg. It's not one, it's many. Yeah. You know, rounds are coming at me and they're well aimed. Uh, this was the first time we really we saw foreign fighters and people who knew how to actually cycle a weapon, right? Mm-hmm. And this is going on. We can't do gun runs because they're up nice and close, right? right. They realize that the ATNs can't shoot at us if they're within 15, 20 feet. So they're they're doing that, and then they're ducking and moving back, and it, it's pretty unique. So ultimately, I was on the 240 doing things you shouldn't do, right? So I've got my arm up on it, kind of being lazy a little bit, right? Firing at them, doing what I'm what I'm doing, and it actually ended up saving me because I'm up like this, uh-huh. and my arm's there. Hit the swing arm, ricocheted off, hit me in the arm, if my arm's not there, that thing probably hits me somewhere in the right. middle of my face. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my arm sucked it up. I didn't know I'd been hit, man. At that point, this is a very kinetic thing. Yeah. We're we're just, we're popping rounds. I was slipping on the gun deck. Uh, I'd lost about a liter of blood, it turns out. So I was, I was, I was, I was leaky. Yeah. And uh, I remember thinking, what the heck is this, man? I thought it was water. Right. Rippets, you know, like they'd hit our cans of rippets. Yeah, or like most fucking IV bag or something. Like right. you don't know what the fuck is going no, on. No, you know, I didn't even think yeah. about the IV bags. Yeah. I gotta be honest, as a medic, I was worried about the rippets. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> it was all about yeah. the caffeine, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> vividly, like, yeah, God, like, please, God, don't, please don't, don't let the rippets, rippets don't, don't the hit the ones, caffeine, don't the, hit the yeah, caffeine, the, the, yeah. the low sugar ones, yeah, right? That, yeah. that was my thing. Yeah, and uh, you know, we're there, and yeah, I just didn't even think about it. Once we realized it, and you kind of came to grips with the fact that I've been hit, you pop a tourniquet on, you tighten it up. But this is after I've cleared the gun, added a new box in, right? We're fed and ready to go. But, but you, so how long? Had you been leaky? Yeah, leaky. Uh, three, four minutes. Probably. Okay, okay. Not, yeah, not, yeah. not long. Got I mean, it. Yeah. These are little spurts, right? Yeah. It's an ebb and a flow. You know, right. it's a crescendo, right? Mm-hmm. So it came to an end. Uh, you do what you got to do, you know, cycle everything, uh, priorities of work. And then I worried about myself, just right. like you're taught, right? It's, yeah. it's muscle memory. And I realized that was the problem, right? I looked at our friends, you know, the, the, my friends, the guys in the truck, our TC and the driver. <laughs> it was definitely a me issue. So I popped the tourniquet on, tightened it up, and then. It started again. So you What's that moment, though, when you look down? Like, because you're obviously doing your own sweep, right? You're, mm-hmm. you're trying to find it. That's right. You find it. Well, there was it. no doubt. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the whole arm was, oh, was okay, ripped okay. open. It was, yeah. So you, you it could, was pretty, like, I knew it. there was blood trailing down my chest on the ground. I identified the problem pretty quick. Again, not right. super smart, right? But I could follow the colors. Yeah. You follow the colors. You get, you look down, you're like, fuck. Yeah. Okay. So you pop a tourniquet on. And but I, did you, like, Try were you like squeezing your 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 hand, like making sure you could still use it? Like oh, what's yeah. going through your head? Absolutely. Well, yeah. and that's a great question. I think you're the only person who's ever asked that. Yeah, you do the functions check. Yeah. Right? Like how bad is this? And everything works. It's a little delayed. So everything works, which at that point you've got to be like, everything works. This is not a bad. big deal. Got it. You know, I've got a little bit of an arterial bleed, mm-hmm. but mainly it's venous at this point. Right. So it's not it's not a constant squirt. Right. You know, my blood pressure was up. My heart rate was probably in the 160s. So everything was pressurized. Yeah. It was about a liter of blood that I lost. And I was like, all right, not a big deal, right? Right. Put a tourniquet on. We'll finish this up. I cinched it down. And then you do what you got to do, right? And gunfight starts mm-hmm. again. So what do you do? You shoot back. Mm-hmm. And we're going at it. And so you have a tourniquet on your left arm. Yeah. You're so back in the fight. I'm back in the fight. And let yep. me tell you something tourniquet pain sucks. It, it, it was. I don't remember getting shot because it was a lot going on. Tourniquet pain is very real, right? Wait, wait, so, in, and I think that's a really important distinction and also definition for the audience because if you've never applied a tourniquet or seen a tourniquet applied, and most of the time when I was training indige, you learn this over repetition, uh, over repetitions and experience, which is like when you have your indige, they don't want to apply tourniquets to the to the degree of pressure that is actually required to stop in order to stop bleeding yeah. because. Guys start like one, they're shot, and then two, they're 
they're in a lot of pain as you're applying yep. a tourniquet in the situation. And then you start amplifying the pain because you haven't got actual pain management on board necessarily That's yet right. either. And so it happens a lot. And what we, what we found out early on is that guys were not applying the tourniquets to the pressure that they needed. And then as they were starting to evac casualties, guys were bleeding out and they were dying. So it's like, hey, motherfuckers, you guys got to like put these down yep. and you can't fucking listen to the casualty. No offense, but you can't because yep. you'll, they'll end up dying if you don't That's get right. them on. You have to crank that thing down. Mm -hmm. And you know, as a medic, I knew that, right? So yeah. I cranked this thing down and we just kept pushing. Uh, eventually it kind of changed. Our, senior, our junior medic at the time mm -hmm. came and put a pressure dressing on, mm -hmm. changed it over. And we wrapped it up. At some point, they pulled me out because we had control of it. Right. You know, and in the drive back, they put me in the TC rather than the back deck. So uh, you're shooting back with one arm, I but am. you got. So you, I literally, you, I'm holding my M4 like this yeah. and I'm placing it out here. My arm is being held up essentially by my elbow by the hinge, and I'm doing this number. Got it. Um, so they at least got you off the, the 240. They did. Put you and back. They eventually got pulled it. me out and put me in the truck on the trip back, but I'm still a senior medic, right? Right. We had a couple other people injured. Uh, this was Costa was gone in the spring. Mm -hmm. It's like April time frame. The pass is closed all the time. Right. So I, I waved off on medevac. I was like, no, I'm not leaving. I'm fine. There's that whole thing again, right? And uh, took care of them, waved off, and I thought I'd catch the next bird. Well, it wasn't the next bird, right? So when yeah. the pass is closed, you got to wait. There's no way to get to you. We're 80 plus kilometers from the next right. American. So you're SOL. And we knew that we had to do something. So... All this is going through. We know we've got to have final treatment on it. And yeah, we went to it. And uh, we prepped this arm for surgery, this arm to help surgerize because I'm make up words. We have that ability here. It makes sense yeah, to me. Right? Surgerize surgery. That's yeah. right. We did a block on the elbow. And, uh, you know, we went to it. We had our weapons guy and an engineer helping. You, you have to explain this. Like, you have to explain the procedure and what does it mean to actually prep it and then conduct the surgery because that, that it, this is fucking wild. So it's just like you see in a hospital. We have our little uh, fire-based clinic, right? Mm -hmm. We've made this. It works really well. We have treatment beds, and we have a surgical suite-ish. You know, it's, it's definitely not the Mayo Clinic or right. Walter Reed, but it, it works, mm -hmm. right? We can do what we got to do. So we wash this, scrub it make sure everything's clean. We're using sterile mm -hmm. dressing, sterile gloves, all of that, just like they do in the hospital. Then you prep this with uh, iodine and everything else to make sure that it's done, and then you have to drape it. So, so you're shaved, you've, 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 yeah. you've shaved your arm, yeah, everything's you've prepped, it, down. You, you prepped, prepped it, it for surgery. And we've laid it the right way, yeah. so I'm kind of moving my body to get where we need to be, and then you have to put the drape over it so you can have a, a clean surface to work on. Right. And then you have to, uh, you know, Figure out how are we going to do this? Now, here's a little thing. We were looking in what's called the War Wound Surgical Handbook. It was this green Bible, essentially. <laughs> of uh, the they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't train fasciotomies. They trained escherotomies from a burn. We talked about it, but they didn't train it. So we're like, the anatomy is the same. Well, tell me what that is. Like, what so is it? So an escherotomy, if you get burned, yeah. uh, it's like a crunchy outer layer, right? Yep. And, and you, you got to open that up so the pressure doesn't occlude the flow of blood in your arm. And the fasciotomy is... Is, I've been injured, there's something occluding it. Yep. It's, and I liken it to a sausage. Mm -hmm. If you have a five-pound sausage skin, you put 10 pounds into it, if there was arteries and veins in there, nothing's going to flow. Right. So we had to open up that skin, the fascia, hence fasciotomy, right. uh, to let the blood flow. Because in this case, everything was kind of being occluded from swelling and pressure and everything else. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're not really trained. At this point, we know how to do it. We know the fundamentals of the anatomy, but no one's really done it. I remember looking in here, and it looked like Homer Simpson had done the drawing on this. <laughs> it, it you're, was just... you're doing surgery on yourself <laughs> yeah, from man. a manual. We're looking at it. Yeah, and then we realized this is not going to work, so we're going to have to go off of what we know and make it work. We talked to folks in the rear, and they're like, are you sure you have to do this? Well, come and get me. I'm sure we don't want to do this, right? but you can't fly, so if you can't come get me, and we have this problem, then yes, we have to do this. Because if you don't do this, Pressure what are the consequences up? of not so doing this? When blood flow is compromised, your arm starts to die. Mm -hmm. So your pain goes up, uh, nerves are starting to fire, muscle tissue dies, right? Without blood flow, that's the complication. At some point, this could probably compromise, lose my arm, all of that right. stuff. I have two hands, one leg. I think we did pretty okay, right, yeah. in retrospect. So we did a two out of three compartments. There's three basic compartments in your arm. Mm -hmm. There's this one, there's a deep medial, and then there's the other side, at the back end of it. 
and uh, we opened it up. Uh, it was it was surreal. I couldn't get my hand to stop shaking while we're doing this. Like because you, I, I am just I'm nervous. Yeah, dude. you're like, you're it's doing surgery on yourself. Right, it's a lot to think yeah. about this. I've got our junior medic and a couple of uh, you know team guys, and everyone's like. Oh, are you really gonna do this? So you did. You did a nerve block. We did. Obviously. We did a nerve block here, and then we had to do a ten cc bump of Valium uh-huh. to get my arm and my body just to calm down <laughs> enough <laughs> to like pull this this off. God, dude. <laughs> okay. I mean, so let me get this straight. So yes. you're shot. You're doing surgery on yourself, and you're also like you had to do a bump of Valium in order to do surgery on yourself. That's right. So you got a nerve block. You're in the middle of. Afghanistan in a in your in your firebase clinic. firebase clinic on volume as your yeah. hand is shaking because you're like fuck it I got to get this thing yeah done. the good thing is I was kind of a bigger guy then I was about two forty you know all I was looking for was just a where it touches the muscles right and I wanted to help me calm yeah not change the the mindset right uh, from a, a metabolic standpoint that was a pretty good guess mm-hmm. and I was gonna burn through it really really quick because my heart rate was. Definitely Whoa! Up. Yeah, where where are you at? Are you you've got to be at like VO two max at this point? Well, like you're doing you you, you got to yeah. have like 180 beats a minute. Like it's a lot. Man. Yeah, we're we are. I'm, I'm out there, right? Heart rate's pumping. I'm like, all right, well, I'm very very focused and serious at this, right? Because this is not awesome. Trying to wrap your mind around doing this, and then we we just jumped in. You do what you got to do. It's that first step. The pop, the hiss. You open it up, and then you deep dive in. And you start seeing the path of, you know, the ricochet and what was left of the round, picking up fragments. And it turns out that a large portion of this actually stole my arm. Uh, it actually got lodged between the two bones in my forearm. Right. So I could have gotten to it by opening up my other side. I would have had to break my arm. Is this AK or PKM? AK. Okay. Uh, AK. And, uh, yeah, I, I drew the line there. I'm like, no, 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 no. We got blood flow. Yeah. We're good. Just walk away. Don't, right. Don't do further harm at this point. So we cleaned it up. Blood flow is good. We get it ha- healthy and happy, and we do a partial closure, put in a drain system like they do in the hospital, yeah. just to wick out everything. What, what, what does that look like? What, so what is this the drain is essentially system? cotton. Yeah. Uh, it's sterile cotton. You pack in there, and it just wicks all the nastiness uh-huh. out of your arm. And uh, in time, it's iodoform gauze is what they call right. it. Uh, it's just meant to, to keep the balance, the pH balance and the, the, the microbes off the tissue right. and to keep it clean. And, uh, yeah, did a partial closer to keep it in and then wrapped it up. And about a day and a half later, they came and picked me up and I flew out to Tarrant Cout right. and had a couple more surgeries. I was back on the fire base a few weeks later and continued on. So you had a couple more surgeries after being shot. You're back in the fire base a couple weeks, three weeks later, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, what, what's the use of your hand at that point? The hand's pretty good. I, I, so I was ambidextrous. Yeah. Uh, I could write with both hands, shoot with both hands. Yeah. It's a little clumsy. And at that point, I still had some uh, some nerve function deficit here. Right. And I still do, like s- some sensory issue. Yeah. But everything works. My grip strength wasn't perfect, but it was good. It was fine. Yeah. It, well, I'm operating. Fine. Yeah. yeah that's fine-ish. wild. Fine ish. Fine ish. Yeah. How much longer was that deployment? Maybe six, seven months. Okay. Yeah. Same year, uh, got hit by the mortar later when they tried to overrun Firebase Anaconda. Right. Yeah, one of those uh, real great things. When you're the first time for something, <clears throat> it doesn't always uh, really awesome. Right. First surgery, first time they tried to overrun a Firebase. Yeah, we got to be there for both of those. Yeah, that that's that that is wild. Yeah. Like, in so you're you're shot. You do surgery on yourself. Um, what's What's your metal citation for yourself after doing <laughs> surgery? <laughs> it's it. You know, I know it's it. You probably. I'm, I'm just. I yeah. gotta. I gotta say. Like, did you get an award for that? No, man. I'm, I'm saying like. Yeah, uh, of you, course not. Like, yeah. dude, I got chastised. They're like, are you serious? Did you really need to do that? Would you want to do that? Like, come on, man. I wouldn't want to do that, Absolutely but you had not. to do it. Yeah, you do what you have to do. Yeah. This this isn't a want thing. This right. is uh, it's better than losing an arm, right? Let's just deal with it. It is weird. and it is. move on. Yeah. And uh yeah, no, no awards were won that day. <laughs> but uh I, I did get a, a butt chewing or two, like, oh man, that's this is what gives SF guys a bad name. Uh, dude, I actually what other choices did you have? There are no choices. And they just never been in that position. Right. But that, that command sergeant major got his CIB by flying out to our fire base, taking incoming rocket fire, and then flying out. Oh yeah. 
He's there's that a guy. few. Yeah, there's a few of those dudes. Yeah. Like I met a few of those like a few of those cats. Like, they were early on. They kind of washed out later they in did. the wars, but early on, like that 03, you still had that pre-9/11 that that the guy that went all to to all the schools never got a DUI, never punched anybody in the face, but he's yep. also kind of like to be fair, kind of weak. It's a PX. Like kind of kind of kind of weak weak sauce. Yep. And like there were a few of those guys that would you'd bump into them, right? Where you know, we were out in the middle of somewhere and uh and we had beards because we didn't have any water. Mm-hmm. So we weren't going to fucking use and this was like Iraq early on. We weren't going to use water. Our only drinking water, right. we had to like shave our faces. And some dude Absolutely. comes in and he's like, why are you guys out here wearing beards? You guys trying to be cool? And it's like, man, this has nothing to, nothing to do with being cool, actually. It has everything to do with the fact that we don't have any fucking drinking water. Right. And like we're not going to use I'm it to gonna, shave our this faces. This is silly. Right? Silly. Why are we having this conversation? It, it makes, makes no sense. Not even aware of anything. <laughs> yeah. So that's a funny story. This same command sergeant major, when I'm in uh, Taren Cow, we had our company sergeant major. He was awesome, Stu. Uh, just awesome, awesome, awesome dude, man. Salt of the earth. Went to the well for his people the right way. Yeah. And then this dude walks in. He could ruin anything. You name it, right? Uh, he's just, he's that guy. He walks in there, does this very smug look, and said, hey, if you're here for more than a few days, you need to shave that beard, and walks off. Now, like, hey, good job saving your arm. Sorry right. you got shot. Yeah. Uh, happy to see you. You're not dead, right? Yeah. None of that. Just shave your beard and dude walks off. Like, really? Yeah. That, that's what you do as a leader? Come on, man. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he was something else. But uh, Yeah, that, that, that's an important point, I think, that I want to talk to you about, which is, is, you know, out of the people you served with, you know, like, give me some examples of, of like, great, great leaders. What did you see that exemplified leadership? And it can be anything. Just, you know, like, pull it out. Well, that's a great question. That is a great question. So, you know, I want to talk about the thing we talked about first. Forcing somebody in this arena to take a knee, to do the right thing, and force me to get out of my own space Mm -hmm. and get healthy and get fixed, I was pissed off. I was angry. I I mean, beyond belief, I was angry. Like, I didn't want to quit. Right. No one's going to tell me I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit when I'm ready. Mm-hmm. It's what I want to do. It's what we're going to do. And to make that hard decision, despite me wanting and pushing and my team and other folks fighting to keep us there, he did what was right. And in the end, it probably saved my life and it kept me from having to deal with something catastrophic. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, let's talk about Odierno. Actually doing what he said. As a four-star general, right? That's freaking amazing. Right. That he followed through. Not everyone's always a great leader, but that's two examples of it. You know, I think uh, talking to uh, some of the guys on, our, on my first team mm-hmm. and teaching them and taking, them, taking the time, there's a guy named Sarun Sar. He said, everything is straight 7-8. you got to learn the basics before you get outside the box. Maintaining and mandating that the guys were actually capable of doing all the things that we said we were capable of doing and holding them to that standard. Because the last place you want to fail or learn that you can't do something is in that two-way gun range, right? He was very focused on that, and it, it was it was something that really struck me. Um, the first job I did at Group, we went out to uh, Washington uh, D.C. to Arlington, and uh, I had to bury one of my best friends from the Q course. I'm a new guy uh, coming in off a trip, and uh, you know, Leroy had been hit, and you're coming out there. And I saw so many good leaders from his team, from our group, from our community, just gutted, you know, over the loss of, of an amazing man and a first-time dad who never got to meet his kids. Mm-hmm. And I saw the outpouring of support and caring and understanding that what really matters, right? Like, that was my first moments in group. And I'm seeing all of this happen and you start to formulate what's going to drive you, who you're going to be. And that's, it, it was meaningful. Because there were great people doing the right thing. And there's always the spotlighters and all those people sure. that just want shit for them themselves. Mm-hmm. But the team guys from his team, from the hallway, from the company, every single one of them, mm-hmm. uh, it, was, it was amazing to watch. And as a new guy, you just you shut your mouth and you observe and you do what you're told to do at that point. And uh, it was uh, 
It was awesome. Yeah, I think that's I think that's an important point. I think, you know, as a as an adult male being the new guy. Like being yeah, man. the shut up and color guy in in a, in an organization that, you know, I think the civilian world when they when they look at things, they're they're like, Well, you become a Green Beret and everybody's just a badass commando. It's like, no, when you're a new guy, you just shut up. That's right. And color. That's what you do. You just shut up and listen. And if you talk back, it it is not going to go well for you. It right. is like if you if you step into a team room with an ego, dude, get ready because <laughs> yeah. it will humble you. Like it, it's like fighting the tide. It, you're not going to win. That's right. You're going to get crushed. Yeah. And you could see those people who thought they were going to step in and be the dominant force. And they do. It is. It's just the tide in the ocean. You're just getting crushed by wave after wave after wave. And either they learned and got humbled and uh, they came back and, and owned it and moved on, or they were the guy that never was on a team for more than a couple months or never did anything, and they just kind of washed out mm-hmm. and you know moved on with life. And what, what, What's your perception, like, you know, as, as, as an SF guy, and, and obviously you, you, you were in – you know, a team room, and then you had another, you obviously had a different MOS, but then you had your perceptions of combat, right? You had the idea of combat. What, what was the, what were the differences that you, you came to realize, like, first, second, third gunfight that you, you were, because I, I have mine, right, where you're just fucking wrong, where mm-hmm. you're like, ah, oh, this is not what I thought it was going to be. What were those things? So, the gaps in space between gunfights on a mission, not understanding the consistency and the constant movement of it, these little bursts of just explosions of everything happening at once. You know, there were absolutely gunfights that lasted a long time, but it's the ebb and a flow, right? Mm-hmm. I, who, how would you even understand that? It, that within a, a gunfight like that, there's these ebbs and flows and the situations developing. Like, I didn't know that, man. How would you know until you really see the battlefield move and understand. And that's why tactical patience is so freaking important not to overreact and get sucked into what they want you to do and understand the ebb and flow and the constant grind of it. Um, The preparation going into it, we all talk about it, but you really start to find the finite skills and the things that matter the most to prepare you for that. And there's a lot of people who talk but you really got to find what works for you, how that happens, and hone those skills. You know, the, I like to joke uh, in the political side that there is no tube sock of education or tube sock of leadership. Mm-hmm. One size doesn't fit all. It's the same way here. Everyone's wired just a little bit different. The tactics and the procedures are the same, but how you prepare yourself and what you're good at naturally and not good at naturally, you got to fine tune those yourself. And you have to be accountable for that. And you have to drive your own functional training to fill those gaps because people's lives depend on it. What would you see in yourself? Where were your gaps that you identified that you went to work on? Uh, Early on, it was a a handgun. Really? Dude, yeah, I could just as well have thrown it at somebody. (laughs) (laughs) Picked up a rock. (laughs) I I, I sucked. I I was absolutely miserable at it. I was good growing up in Montana. Mm -hmm. I could fire a long gun all day, every day, walking, running, jumping, whatever. I was comfortable in that space. But uh, I was also a very big guy, so back then, you wanted to jack weight, get big. Uh, so I was about 240 at my height, 245. It's a lot of weight to carry. Mm-hmm. And f- physics is not your friend at that point, so I had to learn that. But I had to get back to a functional, a functional physical mindset mm-hmm. as opposed to a, a beef-eating, uh, giant human mindset. And then I had to train. I had to break it down and find a way to hold the, you know, Hold the Glock, right? Yeah. That works for me. Mm -hmm. And to cycle it and understand trigger discipline. And then the art of transition when you're a little bit bigger guy and you maybe have some functional things that are an issue, like my left arm. Mm -hmm. I dislocated my shoulder a bunch of times, so there's some anomalies there. And working through that, it was a little bumpy uh, until I found a way that worked for me. Uh, That was an issue. Um, The the pistol was the biggest thing that Mm -hmm. I just absolutely sucked at. I was good at distance marches, rucks. I mean, yeah. it wasn't an issue. No issues there. On CQB, it wasn't something that I had naturally done a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I needed to refine that a lot to get better at it. Uh, maybe I was a little bit slower than most at learning that, just to be honest. Yeah. Um, but um, it, it's interesting because I, 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 
I found the same thing, right? Like I was like jacking a bunch of steel, just getting as fucking big. It, it, you know, I'm I'm five seven, dude. Right. I can only get so big. There's only so much weight you can put on this frame, and you know, getting to you know the top of like a three floor building oh. with a hundred, you know, with with twelve mags and you know two frags and you know a full combat load at that point, which was a ton of weight. Yeah, it was I was like. Oh, I have some big changes I have to I have to make. And 100%. it's like it's about strength and endurance and decreasing, also decreasing the size of the target. It was like, oh, I need to be lighter and stronger. That's that's what I needed to be. I was like, that that was a first that's moment right. of like, Dude. this is too much weight. One, I'm carrying too much shit. Two, I'm carrying too much weight. And three, I need to be really strong and really small. That's, <laughs> that's <right>. like <laughs> brother. When I couldn't turn in the turret yeah. gun truck because I was just too big, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, eh, this is not a good place to be. Yeah. And then it's just what you said. You know who they shoot at first? The big guy. The big guy. Yeah. It's every big target. freaking time. And I was the big guy, right? Everywhere I went, like, shoot that guy. Forget about these little, these little guys running all over. Yeah, hit, hit him. And, uh, yeah, I had to change my mindset. And it was also just physics, man. Yeah. The sheer weight of 240 pounds. I'm 5'9". That's a over big and over and over. Yeah. It was a lot. And then jumping out of planes, doing yeah. free fall and all the things that we do, it, it's a constant grind, man. It just breaks down your, your body physically. So when I dropped down to about two two oh five, uh, I was at my right weight. I was right. still bigger than most, but I was running a sub ten minute two mile right. at that, right? I could maintain that uh, for, for distance. I was able to climb and do anything that was asked of me at that weight. That's where I needed to be. Right. But cutting 40 pounds of muscle was a thing. Yeah. It, it, I think a lot of guys made that realization, especially like getting, going down and up and like yep. sprinting and then, you know, yeah. hiding or, or, or like ladders. Like, dude, yeah. it just, it wears yeah, you out to the point where you're like, okay, that it completely changed what I did. Like, 100%. At that point, it completely changed everything I did. I was like, all right, now I'm going to get on the rower. I'm going to row as hard as I can. I'm going to like, I'm not going to be squat. <laughs> Definitely not me. It's, uh, <laughs> hey, excuse me. It's down in the. I think it's down in the the warehouse. Yeah, it's definitely not like for me. What I what I, it completely changed the way that I that I worked okay. out. Like I went full into CrossFit. Like that's that's what I did. Like I went completely into functional fitness. You know, yep. VO two max. Okay, for how long can I sustain this VO2 max? That's and right. then I'm going to incorporate it. So what I did is I started rolling uh, basically all my workouts into the range. Yep. So I would put on all my kit, and I would do, you know, eight-count bodybuilders and fucking drag tires and, like, mm -hmm. you know. And then those those 200-pound mannequins that, yep. that we had. Heavy. Yep. Oh, my gosh, right? So then yep. it was like – then I was dragging that dude around yeah. everywhere I went – like everything changed for me. Like everything changed after like oh three oh four, my entire life was opened up to a completely different way of of 100%. doing business. Hundred percent, and you're nailing it. You go once you've realized this, and you see where the gaps are. You yeah. realize, holy cow, I am I'm so off base, and you start refining this. For me, cardio wise, it was the bike, it was the rower, yeah. it was you know, long duration movements, that's what you do in combat. When you're doing an offset for five, six miles, 10 miles, dude, who cares if you can lift a car? Who cares? Right? Yeah, yeah, you've got to be able to do more. And you got to go. The functionality of being able to move from target to target, building to building, climb up a building, chase a little guy up a mountain, dude's wearing sandals and is just running everywhere. How are you chasing this guy at 240? Well, you can't. From from my perspective too, it's like when you're so fatigued yep. and over things that you really shouldn't be. Yeah, then yeah. you then you can't make decisions. That's right. And then when you're trying to make complex decisions, so you're trying to solve complex problems and split decision making. That's right. In in the time frame in which bullets and explosions are happening, which by the way is faster than the human mind can actually comprehend. That's right. So you're actually fighting the other person on the other end, but you're fighting their ability to to implement tactics. That's so right. So you have to be able to be cognitively you have to be one step ahead in order to do that you can't be so fucking fatigued that's that right. the only thing you can think about is the burning in your legs or that's right like, i can't catch my breath you actually have to have oxygen flow to the brain 
That's right. And that's the only way. Like, that, that increases your survival. So it's, well, it's interesting. Acidotic, right? Yeah. Nothing works good in an acidotic environment. No. And when you're wearing yourself out, that's exactly what happens. Acidotic. Yeah. So it's a great pH, word. The, the yeah. pH balance of your body, right? Yeah. Everything works best in stasis. Our country, the human body, you name it, right? When you find balance, things tend to work well, right? Yeah. That's where we want to be. And then don't forget the fact that they grew up here. They live here. Their body's attuned to it. You're the dude who doesn't live here. You're already behind the eight ball. And uh, they have home field advantage. That's right. The entire game. They know where all the rocks yep. are going to fall are, where they're not. And you're trying to fight up against all of that while running up a mountain. Yeah, it, it just it, it changed everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I went to selection the first time, yeah. after all this, granted, my leg is, is getting wonky, all that right. stuff. I just put a rucksack on and I rucked and rucked and rucked and I broke my body down, helped cut weight. But it wasn't very smart at that right. point, right? Um, the second time I went, I changed. And I went to more of a try style for training, more functional fitness, yeah. you know, short bursts, long duration, but saving that load and saving mm -hmm. my feet and back. And things like that really made a huge difference. And then you show up at group at that time, there were people pushing us and we had mindsets, mm -hmm. but it was really just individual teams and dudes doing their PT how they saw fit. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the functional, you know, the, the tactical athlete mindset that we have now. That really came out. Well, yeah, it came out because the everything. came out because of the wars, right? So That's I mean, right. it changed everything. Like um, for me, because every you know everywhere I was, I, like I typically had a range or, mm -hmm. or you know close to. So my my entire if you know if I had access to it, I would always work out on the range. Mm -hmm. So then Absolutely. it was like you know I'd shoot off left side, I'd shoot off right side. I'd go from like weekend to strong arm. Mm -hmm. I'd go from. You know, standing, kneeling, prone. So I'd do this, like, standing, kneeling, prone, standing, kneeling, prone, standing, kneeling, prone. I'd just yeah. go up and down, up and down, up and down, and I'd shoot, like, left side, right side, and then I'd just fucking have stacks of magazines. That's right. And then I'd, you know, throw grenades left-handed, throw grenades right-handed, fucking transition from, you know, rifle to pistol, transition from rifle to pistol, RPG, for a transition, mm -hmm. like, from multiple different modes of, of, you know, modalities, so to speak. And then, because these were all the things where you like expect the unexpected essentially train for the K mm -hmm. the, 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 the chaos that will ensue. Right. And you know, I, 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 do you ever have to cook off a grenade when you were like down oh, yeah. range? So uh, like good to have done it prior to the first time. That, that's, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's my whole How's point. Like, <laughs> so the first time you did that, you got to like explain yeah. to me the circumstances yeah. in which that happened. So because I'm not going to die not, at what point. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's a, uh, I, when I realized this, I was like, I'm going to have to, I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. eventually have to cook off a fucking grenade. Like I, and I was, right. and I hadn't really trained for it. hundred percent. So was the first time you cooked off a grenade truly in combat? It was. Like, how fucking stressful is that? Pretty stressful. Yeah. It, it was a thing like, eh, I get it. You briefed <laughs> me. I'm not really sure I'm buying <laughs> what you're laying down here, guys. And and did I cook it off? No, I didn't cook it off the right amount. My perception of time was far different than the reality. It's like a free fall jump. The first time that you come in with bad winds and equipment, mm -hmm. I call it the double oh shit, right? Yeah. Like, oh shit, oh shit. <laughs> then you start worrying about it. I, I was so quick on this, man. And, and it changed the outcome of that. And then you realize, uh, all right, I'm in my head a little bit. Slow it down. Think. Uh, apply what, you, what you're being told. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot different when people are shooting at you. you your stakes go up a little bit. Yeah. I I, uh, I can't imagine, like, uh, like when it dawned on me, I was like, oh, wait, I haven't done this before. Yep. I, uh, I have to prepare for the uh, the the psychological inevitability of this circumstance. So I'm going to have to figure out how to do it. So then I'm like cooking grenades off as I'm like working out and shooting, trying to figure this oh, out. Awesome. And it's like, but I knew I was like, okay, it's an, it, it'll be an eventuality. Thank mm -hmm. God it never happened. So I didn't yeah. have to do it. And, uh, but I would train for it all the, all the time. Yep. And, um, but that was like, Looking at inside, a, you know, being inside the, the the circumstance of a gunfight multiple times, you're like, oh, I see where I will have a a psychological or intellectual hesitation to this moment, That's and right. I will not be prepared for it. So wait, I've got to make sure to be yep. prepared for this. Um, well, stress inoculation, yeah. right? That's mm -hmm. what makes yeah. our community so unique. These guys have been stress inoculated time over time over time over time. You know... Are they aware of every single circumstance? Absolutely not. But they've done enough of this. So 
generally speaking, you know how they're going to adapt, how they're going to think, how they're going to react when that thing happens. And that's why your teams train together mm -hmm. and why we do these finite individual tasks and skills mm -hmm. and build it up into complex movements because nothing ever goes as planned, right? It, it, never start, it started to make sense to me much later in my career. Yeah. I, it did because when you think about skill level one, individual tasks, and then you think about collective responsibility mm -hmm. and then collective skills, it didn't actually click. Like I'm a slow learner at times where – you don't understand exactly what you're doing, but you're just doing it. Because you're told to do it. Because and you're told is, to do it. This is how. Yeah. And I remember distinctly thinking, oh, wait, now I understand why all of us have to have, you know, our mission, mission essential task list, right? That's so right. these metal tasks. And then you start thinking about all the things that you've done in your life up to that point, like to include PLDC. Mm -hmm. And then... Things start making sense. How you're laying in little bricks. Yeah. Little individual yeah. bricks as you build this thing up. Yeah, 100%. And the first time that you're making decisions for others out there in a combat environment or in a difficult si situation, mm -hmm. and you're making a decision that could cost somebody their life, one way or the other, you start to value those individual skills mm -hmm. and the metal tasks and all the little things that you train on because that's, that's a lot of weight on your shoulders. As somebody's dad, their their wife in certain instances, their their husband, uh, someone's son, and you have their entire future in your hands. And if I make a wrong decision, you know I'm willing to die for what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But to know that your friend could die because of what I do, someone you care about deeply and their family, that's that's a lot, man. Yeah, or or, or making a bad decision, which is something that you could have prepared for that That's used right. to drive me crazy. Like I like what am I what am I what am I missing? Because I missed so much. The you know the 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 first exchange of gunfire was was kind of a, a, a an eye opening experience to the point of like wait I've I've missed a bunch. I actually there's a there's a few things I've prepared for, yeah. but this I'm not really prepared for this. So yeah. what else am I missing? Mm -hmm. And then Every iteration after that, you're trying to get as fast and more efficient yep. at learning what what you're basically messing up. Seconds save lives, man. Yeah, right? fractions of a second, right? Yep. So it's like, I, I remember um, very distinctly, what, those were the things that I was, it's like, what am I missing? Like, how else can I think through this problem? Because I have to be able to think through this problem in such a cute, detailed perspective, so I can at least suss out these are the the, the course of action development. So at least I can prepare for that's right something. <laughs> it's like I, I think I think there's a perception that need that, that you know based on we were talking about it downstairs where you know people have this perception of gunfights that are are built on movies yep. and they're inaccurate because it's much more chaotic and it's it way way more unknown you don't especially at the speed of gunfire your first engagement and i'll tell you just from my perception i, I didn't know what the fuck was going on i was like the first i was time? lost yeah 100%. i was i was 100 percent lost i was like what the fuck where's is it coming on? from yeah yeah what's going on there he is there he <laughs> yeah, goes, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. i was like what's going on and i didn't know and i'm yeah. like dude when you're lost as shit yep and then you get scared yeah. so you're like oh i'm lost okay now I'm, I'm and to be fair like i'm i'm fucking scared out of my mind so well like you know evan that that's a great point and this is something that i talk to my kids about and i talk to people all over the country about now everyone's scared man yeah you, if you go into combat and dudes you don't know are shooting at you you don't know anything about the place you're in it is human nature to be scared and that is completely okay it's what you do after that that matters man you just got to knuckle down. You got to suck it up and do what you're trained to do and what you're expected to do to save the lives of the people to your left and right mm -hmm. and focus on the small pieces. Do what you know. Don't overthink this. It's analysis, uh, paralysis by analysis, yeah. right? If you overthink it, man, you're going to stall out and bad things happen. Just do what you know what to do. That's why you got to train and practice and fine-tune all these things beforehand. Uh, yeah. Exactly what you're saying, right? It, it's interesting because courage is one of those things, too, where, like, you know... I, you're every everybody is scared like every and, and if you're not then you have some like you've something completely broken and you, you you have a you know one percent anomaly and ultimately the, those people don't really exist to a high degree 
Um, and then they can be very dangerous too, to point, depending on, on, on how they react in certain situations. And they can how actually they be, make choices yeah. once they're in charge. Yeah. And they can be really dangerous from the collective whole because they become individually a little bit too rogue and then they become a little bit less risk adverse and then they jeopardize the entire element of the team. So a lot of people think that it's this courage is just blatant, um, no fear, right? right? And it's, yeah, not really, actually. There's there's a balancing act. And I think it would just be interesting to, to hear your perspective on just courage. Just so, what, what does it mean to you? Like, how, how do you feel about it? How do you define it? So, you know, I'm actually going to go to a book. Mm -hmm. Have you read Gates of Fire? I'm of sure course. you have, right? Mm -hmm. Aphobos, a right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, the old Spartan, the young Spartan. What is the opposite of fear? Mm -hmm. I, I love this story because I love what it gets to. And it goes back to purpose. What is it that drives you? What are you here for? Why are you doing all of these things? You know, what is the opposite of fear? Aphobos, right? That's a reflexive answer. And uh, the opposite of fear is no fear. Uh, th that's correct. But what is it that actually drives you and gets you moving? Mm -hmm. What do you believe? What is it that gives you that reason, that impetus to go do something that is against your human nature, right? It is, it's not normal to run into the, a hail of gunfire. Mm -hmm. It's not normal to stand there and take it while rounds are popping off around you. What are you actually doing? What is that purpose? Well, you're there for your friends, to the people to your left and right. You're there because you are protecting the things you love. Those resolute things, our country, our way of life, our community, whatever it is, everyone's got their own approach to this, right? But those are the things that I think about. Every gunfight that I got into, I would think of my wife, right? I would think of my family. I would think of those things somewhere in a fleeting thought and what that meant to them. And I would often think about my dad. I was adopted by my grandparents, and he would talk about his experiences in World War II and getting shot at and how he found the courage to go do what had to be done. It's, it's less heroic. It's not Achilles. It's mm -hmm. not things like that. It's yeoman-like, man. It is the slug and the grind of doing what you know how to do. And, you know, uh, courage is saddling up, right, and stepping in and doing what you got to do. You know, it's a hybridization of that John Wayne quote. That's all courage is. It's being momentarily brave enough to do what you're trained to do and then human nature and your skills and what you're trained to do step in, and you just keep going. Does it get easier to do that over time? Absolutely mm -hmm. it does, because you have that mind-muscle connection and memory. But to me, it all comes down to purpose. Why are you there? Why are you fighting? Who are you fighting for? And that gives you that little bump of courage. And you can't forget that it's easy to be resilient with resilient people. It's easy to be courageous mm -hmm. when dudes to your left and right are doing the same thing. But if that moment occurs and you got to be the single person stepping forward, I think it's really important to focus on what you care about. Mm -hmm. Why is it important for me to do this? And if I fail, what are the consequences on the people I love? Yeah, that's good. I th I also think it's it's a batting average too, right? It's it like, is. It's like to your point, you know, and the 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 ebb and flow. I think about uh, gunfights are a lot like rivers. They are. There, you'll have slack water. Oh, yeah. You'll have like raging the craziest rapids that you can imagine and you're just getting beat to shit and you don't know how the fuck you're going to get out of it. And then you're like, you get through it and you're, mm -hmm. and then it's calm. That's right. And it's quiet. And then you're back in this and it just kind of goes, it's a cycle. Yep. And you're not, <laughs> that's, that's the other common misperception is that people think that you're going to, that there are these superhuman characters that just do everything right all the time because they're, they're built like Superman. It's like, no, you got to sign up for the work and continue to sign up for the work. It's actually the hard right over the easy wrong. Every single and time. Every single time. So you're, there, there's, a, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of decisions over the course of a professional lifetime where you're batting average. And there are going to be times when you're like, I fucked that up. Like, I just, I, I, I fucked that up. And you can either, ca you, you can either cower in, in, in that event. Which, you know, there are times when you're like, maybe my head was too far down in the turret when those rounds, when those rounds started popping. Great. Yeah. I'm going to stick it back up and I'm going to make sure that I keep my, keep yeah. my, my head on a swivel and I'm going to step into this, this next engagement That's or right. I'm going to pop back up and I'm going to hit him back at just as hard, yeah. if not harder than I ever have. And I'm going right. to keep my fucking head in the game. And it doesn't mean that that one point in time, and I think a lot of guys, they beat themselves up over that one point in time. They're like, no, it's a batting average, dude. Like, you know what? what it's a, 
you know, Mickey Mantle and Babe Ruth, both they hit over like it was like three thirty or something yeah. like that, and they're in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> and it's like sixty seven percent of the time <laughs> yeah. they didn't hit the ball. Yeah, right. right. It so it's like yeah. it's a batting average, it and it's and it's like stepping in and making sure that you're trying to do the hard right or the easy wrong all the time. And I think that's one of the important things that I took away from 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 my combat experience was one, you got to give yourself a little bit of slack because you're not going to do it right a thousand percent of the time. And two, you can directly apply that to life. It's like hard right over the easy wrong. So that that is exactly it, Evan. And to your point, no one's perfect. These aren't mm-hmm. these aren't robots, right? These aren't yeah. mutants. These aren't uh, you don't go buy green berets or operators or anything at a store, right? Even though you mass produce them, they're human beings mm-hmm. and they have thoughts and feelings. And yeah, you know, one moment doesn't define you as a person, as a husband, as a green beret, as an operator, right? Learn from it, apply that, and God willing, the lesson you learn doesn't cost you your life or a friend, friend's life, right? And there aren't grave consequences, but refine that. Apply that, put it in your kit bag, right? We say that a million times, and keep going. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you look at that, you know, look at kids today, right? How much are they allowed to fail? How much are they allowed to just completely eat it on the playground and realize, wow, I really screwed that up. I completely... Uh, made a mistake, I'm responsible, and here was the outcome, but it's not defeat. Failure isn't necessarily defeat. Mm -hmm. You're only defeated when you quit getting up and trying, right? And we're all going to fail, but that's how we learn so many vital lessons, right? Almost every lesson that really mattered, I learned because I screwed something up. Mm -hmm. Almost to a T. You know, every single one of those, it was like, wow, that really sucked. Like, hey, if your leg hurts really, really bad, you should go see a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. Yeah, put it out there for public, uh, public use. But uh, yeah, I, I think that's a that's a super important point. I think because of this generation, because of social media, and you know, yeah. think about it, man. Like when we were 16, 17 years old, how much? I don't know about you, but I did a I did a oh, yeah. litany of dumb shit. There were no cameras, thank God. Exactly. No phones, right? right? Nothing was out there for the world to see. Yeah, and it's like these these. I'm not saying these kids, but people live in this circumstance where everything they do, they're graded on from the from the moment they're born. That's right. To the day that they die, and then they're going to go back 10, 15, 20 years, and they're going to look at somebody and what they're saying on Twitter or what they did when they were 15 mm-hmm. years old, and you're going to be graded by what you were doing when you're 15, when you're 40, like I'm a completely different person. I've like, granted, I'm still the same genetic makeup, but this thing's done You've learned a lot. Too, it's right? a totally different That's person. Right. So it's, I think it's an unrealistic expectation to assume yes. that people aren't going to make mistakes. And more importantly, to not be openly accepting a failure. Yeah. Like people have to get out of their own fuck. Absolutely. Get out of their own way. Oh, a- absolutely. And you got to look at what that drives them to do. Mm-hmm. If the whole world is predicated on 30 second sound bites, what are people doing? Oh my They're gosh. not learning the depth and breadth of how to do a skill and how to fail a hundred times over. Uh, Edison, incandescent light bulb. Yeah. We wouldn't have light if he hadn't failed thousands of times, right? However, we do. The world's a better place for it. Uh, many other sub conversations right, yeah. with that. But it's the same thing. Everything's on TikTok. Everything's on YouTube. And that's what people want to be. And they're not putting the hard work in. But that's where people like us coming from a different arena really have to be a part of that process. Mm-hmm. You know, I like to look back to the World War II generation when we, when we talk about this. They weren't the greatest generation because of war. War doesn't make you great. The things you learn in war when applied to life, I think they're transformative. They change the future of this nation. You and I grew up in a world largely built and dominated by the lessons learned by those guys, and it created the 80s and the time frame that we grew up in. Mm-hmm. We're a byproduct of that. It was America, Ronald, Ronald Reagan. It, it was everything was hitting on all cylinders. We were at a high point. And how did that happen? Well, they rolled their sleeves up, they continued to serve, and they did things in the community, put in the hard work. They learned how to build a business, how to go to college and become a doctor, a nurse, uh, a dentist, whatever they were going to do. Mm. And they made that their mission, to leave things better than they got it. You know, we have to continue to share what we learned. You know, one of the things that 
that I often talk about, and I had to come to grips with this. You know, we call ourselves quiet professionals, right? We maybe talk smack about some of our SEAL counterparts because they write books sure. and yeah, make yeah. movies, right? Yeah. They have great hair. I'm they bald. Do. Yeah. You know, yeah, they do. That's not me. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I'll tell you one thing I learned from the SEALs and something they do get right is at least they talk and they have a voice and they explain where we come from, what our experience is relevant to, and how it matters. And for a lot of times, and f for a lot of history, frankly, we didn't do that in the army and in soft at large because quiet and silent were viewed as the same thing. So when you're silent, people speak for you, mm -hmm. right? And that happened a lot. I mean, go look at what people represent a Green Beret as. We think of Rambo. Yeah. That's it. Or mm -hmm. if they're older, they think of John Wayne. Mm -hmm. That's it. But when you're quiet, people wait to hear you speak. The functional intelligence associated with our community, the ability to solve complex problems, to have a moral compass that has not only been tempered, but tempered in a place where it costs people their, their lives, matters. Our nation fundamentally was founded by people who disassociated with Britain, right? Fundamentally shifted the future of two countries because they believed in something. That same thing showed itself in every war throughout history, right? In some way, shape, or form. And most, most assuredly with World War II, we have to do the same thing. We have to share the lessons learned. It didn't matter what race, creed, color, mm -hmm. gender, where you were from. I didn't ask someone where they were born if I was gonna run into a hail of gunfire. You do what you have to do. They're my brother, they're my sister. I'm gonna do what I'm expected to do and save that life and fight that battle because they're there, because they're one of us. Mm -hmm. That's what the focus has to be on. And when we bring that ability out into the business sector, into education, even into politics, it changes the game mm -hmm. completely. We have to jump forward. We have to continue to serve. And I really fundamentally believe that if people like us who understand what it's like to bleed for a country, to bleed for our, you know, a, a fundamental belief or to build things, you know, like, like, like you, you have an ethos and a fundamental set of values you've trued and tried and you've created a black rifle, which is amazing, but you have a story to tell and you're sharing those lessons on a national platform, that voice matters. If we fail to share our lessons, who are we failing? We're failing ourselves, our tribe, all the people we buried, we're failing them mm -hmm. because we're not using our voice. We're not applying those lessons. And I'll tell you more than anything else, I, I am grateful to be a Green Beret. I'm even grateful to learn all the hard lessons I did. And, and I mean that because I can share them now but those aren't the things that define me. Man, I, I'm a dad and I'm a husband, first and foremost. I am not gonna fail my children, and we can't be that generation that fails this nation because we fail to apply what we know and what we learned and to step into the fray and save this nation, to save a business, to save a community. It's on us. Mm -hmm. Change always comes from people like us, and it's the change that matters. We have to do that. It's on our shoulders. I think that's uh, I think that's well well articulated. I think that's a fucking huge point. I think understanding duty, like that's right. Yeah, like there's what you want to do, which is something that's of choice, and then understanding oh, man, what is your duty. Yeah. Like people, I think I think we'll, we'll, we'll get into duty. Let's go to the bathroom real fast. Cause I gotta eat, then we'll come back for so duty. So let's let's. Let's start to unpack, you know, how, how do you articulate this? Like, what, what, when you look at yourself, your sense of duty, your sense of purpose, how are you clearly differentiating these things? Like, I, I'm just interested to hear your perspective. So, you know, that, that's really the, the key part of this. And again, it goes down to what is it that, that you believe in? What's bigger than you? What is your purpose uh, that you get up for? You know, duty means many things, and I think it's very much a, a tailored and scaled approach to this. You know, we have a duty to our nation. We talk about that all the time, duty on our country, right? Mm -hmm. You hear people talk about that in video games, on TV, uh, whatever the case may be. But duty comes, I'm a dad. I'm responsible for what I teach my kids, and if I prepare them. Mm -hmm. I was actually talking to my, uh, my boys last night, two nights ago, two nights ago. It's all blurred blur sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, on this exact thing. And they're like, Dad, why are you so strict on certain things? Are you mad at us? Do you not like us? And I was like, Bud, no, man. And it makes you, it is a dad. It makes you well yeah. up a little bit, right? Like, no, dude, it's because I love you. You got to think where I came from. 
my duty to you, and that's the word we used, mm-hmm. is to prepare you for whatever comes your way. Life isn't always going to be easy. But if I fail to teach you those skills or to teach you uh, a way and a mindset to deal with those things, not only have I failed you, I failed our entire family. I failed your wife, your children, whatever it may be, because I failed right now to do that. And that's why I'm going to push you so hard on these things. You know, you have to learn these things. There is no shortcut to success. It is your duty to learn these things. So when they're all stacked up, you can make that test. You can go play that sport. You can make those hard decisions the right way because you've got a moral compass that we're starting to hone Mm -hmm. and we're starting to build and refine under pressure. That's how you get to be somebody great who can change. I grew up in a trailer. I was adopted by my grandparents. We were dirt poor. That's where I came from. Historically, people like me don't get into these arenas. Mm -hmm. And I had to explain to them where I came from and the vivid memories I have of having a wish sandwich, right? I wish I had something on my bread. Oh, a wish wish sandwich. Yeah. Or a jam sandwich. And that's what you got, man. Mm -hmm. Like, Dude, we're talking about for you, what shoes, which Jordans, which pants, what, right, whatever. You have right. choices and opportunities that never would have been afforded me. And I remember growing up on commodity cheese. I remember all of those things. And I don't want our family to fall back into what I was trapped in. Mm-hmm. We're shifting that paradigm for our family. And all of these things matter. Just like every skill set we learn in combat matters, every single thing you're doing, every you know, subject in school, every relationship, every interaction matters because you're learning muscle memory for you to put together when you're making decisions on your own, buddy. And if I'm failing you now, I'm failing you down the road and I can't fail because I know exactly what I'm fighting for. I know where my duty lies and it's to my family, it's to our state, it's to our country and it's to the people that we buried. Mm. And I, I, I remember every single one of the people I've known and all the ones that we've lost in combat that I was there for. And that is burned into my memory. And I refuse to fail them. And I think we have to take just a second longer when things are hard or you're given a moral situation where you have the ability to take the easy out as opposed to doing the hard right. You know, that easy wrong mindset again. And that's what our duty is. It's layered and it manifests itself in every single thing we do. But our nation has gotten away from that, right? We talked about uh, a trophy for everybody. We've talked about, you know, what are you going to do for me as opposed to what can I do for others? Right. It's service before self. You know, ultimately, in the military, you did it many times, ran in and, and saved teammates. They did it for you. That's what we do. That's the cost of, of business. That is the expectation. It didn't happen easy. We got there over many, many, many years. But you got to put those blocks together and learn that, metal task you gotta learn that level one basic thing like no really you have to pmcs the vehicle because Mm -hmm. it will fail at the worst time possible right and all those things build up to me that's a very long answer i know but that's what duty is Mm -hmm. that is what it's all about and if we fail to to teach those simple tasks and to take the time in the military and focus on metal tasks and things that are actually predicated on killing the enemy as opposed to you know social and societal nonsense we're going to bury people. And that's a very real cost. That's someone's son, daughter, dad, wife. That's a real loss. And it's the loss of what they were going to become. Right. You know, we'll, we'll get to the next, next step of this mm-hmm. when we talk about politics. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's a question I had to ask myself. Well, I guess that's my point is, like, do you see politics as your passion or your duty it's a duty right unequivocally it is not my passion Mm -hmm. i don't know anybody that i'm close to that would want to run for politics Mm -hmm. i wanted to be on a boat in the gulf fishing um now perhaps i wasn't being honest with myself we are our own worst enemies we are who we are we're driven we want to get stuff done i thought i would retire and work in my nonprofit and make a difference that way yeah and i'd be out scuba diving and hanging out with my kids that was never going to be the thing. I am just, we are who we are. But, you know, when it comes to politics, 
I really, I had the tipping point with my son, and we talked about it mm-hmm. earlier, you know, where he, he has a way to say things that just cuts through all of the nonsense. And, you know, he said, Dad, you're whining, right? What are you going to do about it? Right. So you ask yourself, well, what, what can I do? Am I willing to jump in? Am I willing to take this, this burden on? But a, as you look at this, it, it wasn't what I wanted, right? Mm-hmm. It wasn't what I wanted. And I had to come to grips with the idea that it wasn't about me. You know, when I look back through my career, and you touched on this earlier, I wanted to be an operator, right? Period. That's all I wanted to do. I wanted to get back there, and I wanted to go do my job that I had trained for over all these years. And when I got injured, you heard me say it, I didn't want to come off the team. I didn't want to stop doing this. And our leadership said, you got to go figure this out. I wanted to keep doing this. It wasn't ever about me, right? Mm -hmm. That's the thing. When we focus on what individuals want, what I want, versus what's good for the, the team, mission success, all those things that matter, it changes your mindset. And when I realized that, I could come to grips with a couple things. One was the whole quiet and silent thing. You know, if yeah. you're going to do this, your whole life is out there for the world to see. Everything. They're going to attack you. They're going to attack your family. I've had death threats. I've had people come by our house, you know, looking for me, looking for my family. I've had our uh, home address put out on podcast, telling people to chase us down and give us no peace. That's the reality of <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, I would pick a softer target in my house. <laughs> Just, yeah. uh, that's a bad target yeah, analysis bad, right there. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's bad. in the end, are you really in this for the right reasons? Yeah. Because they are going to be a part of every single thing you do. Mm. And I think that's where the differentiation lies. If you have people that, despite that, want to do it for the wrong reasons, they don't have a moral compass that's been tested. They're doing this for personal reasons and gain and everything else. And I think you see a lot of politicians, unfortunately, who may start off the wrong way and get pulled into that. You think there's a lot of those? That, that I think are there's like... some. Uh, I don't know if there's a lot. I yeah. haven't been at that this long to really ascertain that number. Right. Um, but I think most people that I've seen jump into this for the right reasons. There's a few who obviously did it for the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. And, and you can see where their moral compass is, what drives them. It's, it's readily apparent. But for many of us, God, I didn't want to do this. Yeah. I really didn't. I wanted to do anything but this. But I really got to a point where I just didn't see any other outcome but to get involved. How can we sit here yeah. and let our country fall apart, knowing well what we've learned, how to apply it, and what we can achieve? And what do we do? Mm-hmm. If it's not me, then who's going to do it? Yeah, if, you know, if not me, then who? If right? not now, then when? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That legitimately Man. was the cycle of yeah. things. And I actually sat and talked to regimental leaders mm-hmm. in, 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 in the SF regiment. I, I, was, I was really torn up by this. I said, I, I, I don't want to talk for the regiment yeah. because if I do this, they're going to say everything that I do, good or bad, reflects on every single Green Beret who's out here doing it. For sure, yeah. And that matters, man. I have a duty to them. You know, we, we've all buried friends. We've all done things, and I don't want to embarrass it. And mm-hmm. I, I talked to some senior guys in the regiment and in the community, guys who I know and trust, and they're like, dude, you still don't get it sometimes. You're, you're kind of a slow learner, aren't you? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know me, right? <laughs> Does this surprise you? <laughs> but, and they were like, look, man, you know who you are. You know what you're fighting for. You're exactly the person we want out there. We need people like you telling our story. If you're not telling the story, man, in today's world, you're irrelevant. Mm-hmm. And if you want to change things, and, you know, this is the final thing that I really broke it down with. If I was willing to deploy into a country that wasn't ours to go fight beside people I didn't know to protect freedoms in our family here at home, why would I not give all that I could and more here at home here. to do the same thing? Mm-hmm. And when I, I came to that breaking point, there was no doubt in my mind that this is absolutely what we need to do. This is where we have to be, and it is a duty. And when I look at this, there's a relentless approach that our community has. And you can tell when you're doing it for the right reasons because people are absolutely relentless. Mm -hmm. I will not leave a single thing on there. I'm going to walk it through, and I want to do more because I don't want to fail. If we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. And the cost of of all of this is my self-interest. It's not my time. It's what can we achieve. We're protecting things for our kids. I'm not going to fail being a dad. I'm not going to fail our state. I'm going to make sure that everything we do matters and it's done right. 
and I'm gonna get other people to do it. But that's why we have to draw people from our community in. I think it's a very rare breed. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, you know, going back to that, the uh, quiet professional, you know, I think that uh, uh, SF guys just in general, they they sometimes, uh, you know, there's, there's an there's a ongoing debate all the time. And it's, to your point, there's the difference between being silent and a quiet professional. By That's the right. way, if you're in, there's a different, it's, it's, it's just different. When, when you're out, because, you know, people talk about this a lot where they're like, you guys, it, you use your resumes to go out and promote, you know, yourselves or your company or whatever it is. I'm like, but I wouldn't go to law school and then not tell people that I went to law That's school. Right. Uh, you know, we went through selection. We went through, you know, a combination of things that made us very, um, very, it, it's very selective and it's, right. and it denotes the individual, the, the type of individual you are. So why wouldn't you tell people based on your professional background, who you are and what you've done? It's, it's, there's a difference between a, what I would say is exploitive and, and, and ultimately just telling people That's what right. you did so they have a greater context to who yeah. you are. It would be disingenuous to your professional background and who you are and what you did for 20 years of, of service of the course of your, your entire right. development to not tell people. If you just went out and said, I was in the military, that's right. What? Okay, man. Well, that, that puts you into a group of people yep. that are, are, I think last time I checked, there's, what, 23 million veterans in the United States, Something give like or that. take a couple. And then and then there's a couple million global war on terror veterans, but then there's a very, very small percentage of war fighters, and then there's yep. an even smaller percentage of special operations war fighters. That's right. And it, what it does is it, it tells people accurately who you are and the other piece that we have we have to understand is that we have an entire generation of war fighters that one we have to hand the baton to the second generation of what i would say is the warrior class so Absolutely. believe it or not um i think it was uh this was it the secretary of veteran affairs secretary i she said i want to break the chain of of, of the warrior class and then the, that's that's really wrong. It's it's not only wrong; it's illogical. There's so many different reasons why that that in itself is just a statement of pure ignorance. We have to preserve the warrior class to preserve our country, and so when we look at the entire special operations community, and I think when you say duty. We have a duty and an obligation to go out and tell our stories to other men and women that want to join the military to do what we did. Because I was influenced by, here's a great example. I was influenced by a, a Green Beret when I was 16 years old. And I was in his house by chance. And I had a book in my back pocket that was, uh, was like the Navy SEALs, something, something, right? And he's like, hey, what's that book? I was like, it's Navy SEALs. These guys are super yeah. badass, man. He's like, he handed me the... Uh, a book by Colonel Do Donald Sutherland, believe it or not. It was a history of, of special forces from you know, 1950, give or mm. take, before, ultimately, you know, before there was a, an official special forces to like yeah. 1978 or something. And if it weren't for him injecting into my life at that point in time, I would have been in a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. And... So what's the difference between what I would say is is a former Green Beret injecting themselves into the lives of a younger, you know, man, now I guess, you know, man or woman, right, to become a professional soldier versus going out and telling a story. I think there's I think there's a very distinct difference between um doing something that your duty, you know, what your duty calls. That's right. Doing something that's exploitive because uh you know, exploitive would be, okay, well, I'm using this in order to, I'm using this as a disingenuous, disingenuous way to sell something so I can ultimately profit to build something that's unethical. By the way, I think that would be something where, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a complex debate versus saying I was an SF guy. I've that's never right. said, 
I'm the best SF guy. You need to buy my coffee. That's why. <laughs> like, no, I'm just like, hey, right. man, I'm a former Green Bray. I like drinking coffee. I like roasting coffee. Great. I also did a bunch of other stuff. Right. We support a bunch of veteran nonprofits. We roast great coffee. Great mission. Great coffee. Buy if you want to. Don't buy if you don't want to. Awesome. Right. Lots of other choices. I think it's similar, not to over uh, articulate this, but I really wish the community from an SF perspective would start to embrace and encourage. Yeah. We have to recruit. Well, honestly, we have to recruit really good Green Berets too, man. Like 100%. if we have more people trying out, it only strengthens the force. You cannot mass produce you soft. You can't. But you've got to put more people into it if you want more quality people out of it, right? Yeah. L look at the problem we have. The world is not getting less complicated. No. I mean, it, it, it's a mess. If you think that the world a safe, is not a safer place when America is strong and has strong, resolute, functional leadership, you need to just take a step back and look at the big picture of things. When we lead and when we do the right thing as a nation and we live by our values, a lot goes better in the world uh, because, frankly, I think we were built and purpose-built for a reason, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, there's no... There, it, look, I, I think the evidence is empirical. It is. Like It is, which is... If, if America is leading what I would say is the international political ideology mm -hmm. and the international eco economic ideology, it's a better place. I mean, it it's, it's, the data proves itself. Absolutely. And by the way, it also proves itself, and I'm, I'm going to overemphasize this point, which is in America, you're statistically more likely to die of obesity than you are starvation. What that says is that you have a well-fed society. That's right. We're not dying of famine. Yeah. And it's less likelihood right now in the world today that we live in that you're less likely, internationally, by the way, this isn't just in America, that you will die of obesity or of a caloric excess disease than you will yeah. of starvation. So Absolutely. And there are many fundamental sub-discussions with that, with that, right? Look at the food deserts. Look at high caloric output, low nutritional value foods and the mm -hmm. things we have out there. And uh, agriculture and cooking and all, all of those familial things. But I'll take it back to what we talked about. The breakdown in our country is from the breakdown of the American family, the values that we espouse, what made us who we are as a nation. Coming back to that, let's talk about the duty to draw people into soft. Absolutely, mm -hmm. we have a responsibility to do that. When I retired, I didn't walk away from the regiment, right? I called them when I wanted to do complex things. I try to involve them in every single thing I do. When my kids grow up and they leave the house, um, I'm not gonna turn my back there and I'm not done, right? They're <laughs> right. gonna be my kids. I'm gonna yeah. keep fighting and defending and providing them opportunity. It's the same way here. If we care about what's going on, man, we gotta put that information out there and nobody is gonna speak better for our community or be a better person to sell it Mm -hmm. than us. And to your point earlier, it absolutely is about, you know, are you capitalizing on this? Are you saying things that are untrue? Are you putting this in a perspective that is only self-serving? It's okay if, you know, you have a business and it grows because you're doing something that really is awesome, right? It makes a difference and you happen to be a Green Beret. But that's not how this relationship, you know, you're not doing it the other way. You're not exploiting this. I, I, and, and I fundamentally believe that. I didn't use my story or talk about it in politics to exploit it, it's a talking point that normalizes who I am. It speaks so much more. It's like the old recruiting posters from uh, SF, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they won't talk about it, and it speaks more about them than they'll say about themselves. It does. Mm -hmm. In that one picture, or in someone knowing we're a Green Beret, everybody's story and the history of our regiment is tied into who we are, and we do represent that, and we have to take this serious, and we have to continue to serve. And if we want this to continue down the path, we better be part of helping to solve those issues and get the right people in and get our country and you know our world in a position where we can do this job. So if you look at the military right now, they're breaking it down, right? They're ripping soft apart. Yeah. They are losing their moral compass. And look at the amount of, of officers right now who grew up with us, who are 05, 06, mm -hmm. one star, they're in that macro decision maker level. If we promote the wrong ones, we're going to be in a world of hurt because, you know, the the Obama and Biden administrations, they fired a lot of general officers. Right. And I, I think we can agree 
you know, regardless of politics, it didn't always promote the right warfighters mm -hmm. into positions. And we made decisions that weren't about taking the fight to the enemy and dealing with war as it is. It is inherently nasty, people are gonna die, and things are hard. And we have to prepare our men and women to go do that. Because when they find themselves there, that can't be the hardest thing they've ever done. Mm -hmm. We owe them that. Well, I think that, that that's a good point, which I, I wanna come back to. Um, well, I, I want to come back to a combination of things here, but I think I, I have some thoughts around just SF guys as they transition because yep. what, what, you know, the, the Green Beret is such a part of their identity. It becomes their purpose, who they are, who they are and redefining themselves and creating purpose post-service becomes very difficult because they're going through an existential crisis. They don't quite yep. understand who they are and what they want to do. More importantly, they're, they're struggling to find a greater purpose in their life after service. That's right. How do but you? But you're overcomplicating Rice Krispies. <laughs> I mean, I gotta be honest. Rice Krispies right. are a great cereal. They come mm -hmm. in a blue box with little elf things on it, right? Yeah, yeah. They make a kind of a cool noise. They taste pretty good, right? You can apply some fruit, some sugar. It's Rice Krispies. We all know what it is. Yeah. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't get lost in the existential sauce. Right. And again, I take it back to, and I actually spoke at a graduation for the Honor Foundation, which was great. A bunch of soft people and. I ask folks, why do you do what you do? What's your reason for getting up? That's your purpose in every single thing you do. You're not going to combat because you like getting shot at. Very To your point earlier, no, very few people are that way mm. and are just void of any fear. Uh, you're there for a purpose. What do you believe? When you retire, your purpose is still the same. That didn't change. You're still providing for your family. You're still protecting your family your home, your community, your state, your country, whatever it is that you believe that drove you to do these things, that still matters. For me, it was a combination of all those things, and it was, frankly, just this internal drive to not let my family fall back into the poverty that I came from. Mm. I remember that. I will never let that happen, and I will go to the grave and work myself until I can't stand to make sure that my children have the ability to do amazing things and change the world because they're not worried about making sure they have food on the table. I've been there, right? I understand that. I don't want that for my kids. And those are the things that drove me. It's the hierarchy of needs, right? Once you have shelter, food, water, all those things, you can start worrying about things as you go up the pyramid. That's the reality of it. And what we're talking about here is something fundamental for our nation. I don't want our nation to fall back into civil war. Right. I don't want our nation to be in a position where we have an existential crisis of who we are as a nation. Are we going to flirt with communism? Are we going to fall back into the trappings of that? You know, where the government's going to give everybody the same outcome and those meager droppings that the government gives you get smaller and smaller and smaller as time goes on, right? Mm -hmm. Are we going to fall victim to that? Or can we, purpose-driven, you know, functionally intelligent special operators and Green Berets understand that those same things we held true and we served, nothing changed. Just because you retired doesn't mean that part of you stops. You're still a Green Beret, but you're still a dad and a husband and all those experiences are with you. You just gotta find a new way to apply those skills. And you gotta be humble. You know, we talk about this all the time coming through the course, be humble or life will humble you, right? It's the same thing, man. I, I wasn't gonna step in and, uh, you know, you're a bit the anomaly. You built a company. It grew. It's awesome. I didn't step in and become the CEO of Black Rifle. How hard did you have to work to create this? What was the hard work and dedication and the time and all of the bleeding and, and just the pain train that you went through to get there? Nobody sees that. We've got to be humble enough to go back to the well and go to selection. Selection is an ongoing event, right? That's what we learned. Every day is selection day. It's the same thing once you retire. you got to prove yourself, man. Just because you have a tab doesn't mean there's anything special other than the tab. You earn your place in the tribe every single day with your actions. Never stop competing, don't self-select, and keep proving yourself every day. And when you keep that focus and that tenacity and you know your skills are gonna translate, everything else takes care of itself. You'll find what your passion is, what drives you. It's that simple in my mind. <coughs> no, that's, that's, that's very helpful insight. I think there's a lot of people that, I, you know, and I talk to from, you know, my my uh, former ODA or, mm -hmm. or guys that I knew in the teams or guys that I worked at the agency, it's, it's listen, you know, like if transitioning out and, you know, retiring and then hitting a 
you know, playing 36 <coughs> holes a day. If that's it, dude, then yeah. that's it. That's More great. More power to you. Great. More power to you. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's great. But don't expect... <laughs> this is this is a conversation I love to have, which is like, don't expect that not working hard is going to give you fulfillment and provide that hole <coughs> or fill up that hole that, that that you had when you were in the teams. Because part of the part of the whole thing is Absolutely. one, they forced you to do a bunch of shit that you didn't want to do. And you've got this incredible muscle. Actually, it's a section of your brain which is you're capable, SF guys are more capable than most people based on the circumstances they've had professionally <coughs> to do a bunch of shit that they're, they don't want to do. So now, by, yep. uh, by eliminating that aspect of your life, by discontinuing that portion of your brain and going out and saying, well, I'm going to just you know, swing golf clubs or whatever it is they want right. to do, right? You're yeah, eliminating golf fishing, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah hey, that's my thing. Like, you're not challenging yourself. You're not forcing you right. to step outside and, and to break your own paradigms and to go out and say, you know what? This is going to be really uncomfortable. I'm not going to fucking like this, but I'm going to do it yep. because of duty, because of purpose. And part of this is the struggle that I think all of us want. That's right. Which is. The burden. You're of alive, being, man. You're, yeah, you're. Hey, this is this is the the greatest philosophical question that we could ever ask. That's right. Is is, you know, what is the meaning of this? Like, th this is a huge philosophical question that honestly, like, re religious leaders and mm -hmm. philosophers and everybody has struggled with. From, which I love pointing this out to people, which is, you know, Socrates was an infantryman. Sure was. And if people don't understand that from the perspective of 2,500 years of intellectual, in intellectual development and philosophical questions were essentially put together put together yep. by an 11 Bravo. Who <laughs> like, talked about people who weren't learning and applying their lessons and wouldn't stand fast. You mm -hmm. know, uh, his general officer, I can't remember his name, mm -hmm. actually talked about if I had had more people like you who would just fight their own inclinations and stand in line, we wouldn't have embarrassed our, our city, right? We wouldn't have lost this war. It's that 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 fundamental value, right? When people who understand what's at stake are out there in the mix helping do this and remaining relevant, one, as a person, you're alive, man. Mm -hmm. Everything matters. Everything. Find that next ridge line. You know, we talk about it as a Green Beret quite a bit in our community. It was very cliche and something we really talked about from like, you know, uh, I would say 15 through 20. What's your next ridge line? How are you going to do it, man? But I love the fact that we framed it that way because that's all it is. It's a continuation of the life skills. You were selected for your traits, your capabilities, your ability to work with a team, solve complex problems. Why would you stop doing that? Do you know how rare that is? When I transitioned and I realized that not everybody's like us. Dude. It was a stark realization. And, you know, we talked about it jokingly out there. You can't just talk. And we did it here a little bit. You can't just talk the way you do in a team room, mm -hmm. you better start learning a new language and drive yourself. When you went to language school, you learned a foreign language for the first time. I had to learn that in the nonprofit sector. I had to learn that in the government sector. I certainly had to learn it in politics. And then I had to understand how to carry myself. And you got to understand how do people think about you when you walk in a room? And is that what you want or is it not what you want? And then how do you sway that opinion for that person in the mm -hmm. public opinion do what you have to do is social change theory, right? If you look fundamentally big picture, we didn't lose social change theory. Is it is it? social yeah. change theory, right? You know, how do we get people to do what we need them to do? Yeah. You know, in combat, we train them, we're there with them, we break bread, all these, these little tools of unconventional warfare. It's the same thing here. If you want people to vote a certain way or espouse certain values, you've got to be present. You've got to be there communicating with them. You have to talk. And, and understand one what you're talking about, but you got to be someone they want to follow. Mm. You got to, it's the head and the heart, right? It's just not a double tap, right? <laughs> you got to know what you're talking about, but people want to follow you. People follow leaders. It's an emotional thing. They hear you, but they follow you because they believe in you. Mm. That really matters. And again, we have been tried and true, and people will follow us because we've been and seen a thing or two. That really makes a difference. And when you get out of your head and you realize that what we're fighting for is just as black and white, just as binary, if you will, the loss of life, life is every bit as real as it is in combat. 
If you screw up in combat, your teammate dies. If we fail to act here and be a part of this thing, teammates are going to die. Look at the lawlessness uh, during COVID, the things that happened. That wasn't the American values, the things we fought for. Right. Defunding the police, things like that. It's ridiculous. I mean, at its, its basic level, it is nonsense. So you're going to defund the police to make things safer in an area that's rampant with crime. I don't understand where you get to where you are in that conversation. It, no. It's nonsense, yeah. right? It's fairy tales, but that's the reality. People are out there espousing that, and they're out there in on YouTube, and they're putting it in the newspapers, and they're putting it in books, and they're also putting it into uh, our education system. Yeah. What we teach our kids today is the reality of our country tomorrow. Mm -hmm. now, let's think about that. You want to talk about the resolute nature of this nation, those things that we hold to be self-evident and true, mm -hmm. They don't talk about those things in school anymore. You know, I'm actually running legislation this year that's going to mandate that we talk about Veterans Day and Memorial Day in Florida. And we're a pretty freaking free state, yeah. right? We talk yeah. about the right things. Mm -hmm. You know, Governor DeSantis has been extremely aggressive and forward looking in this approach. And then I also want veterans involved in this. It's important that veterans come out there and children see what it means to be a veteran. Some will be injured, some won't, but they believed in something bigger than them, worth dying for, fighting for, and it was their duty to protect that, and it's their duty now to get out there and do it, and we have to let them be in schools. Kids need to see that. Like I can remember, just like yesterday, the first time, and I was a kindergartner, when veterans came through, uh, I was a first grader, and Dave Reaver you know, uh, came through our school. Who's Dave Reaver? Dave Reaver is a Vietnam veteran that got burned really bad. Yeah. He used to have this shtick where he'd take off his prosthetic oh, ear yeah. and play the yeah. piano. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's uh, he, That was my first exposure to any of this. And it right. was, I was obviously shocked, and all of us were, like, that this dude's out there doing and saying these things. But you need to see that. It sets the tone. Mm -hmm. it, it, again, shows you something that really matters in the big picture of things. And, again, it's our duty to be there. Right. Yeah, it, it, it's really interesting because I think as you start to look at purpose, because, you know, obviously in the military, mission and purpose that was clearly defined specifically for you, and it was That's articulated right. through a combination of means all the time, right? So you're always going back to Army values, you know, the, the, S, the, the SF creed, you know, we're, we're talking about leadership, and not Absolutely. only are we talking about leadership, we're... <clears throat> We're having courses on leadership all the time. Uh, and then you're getting these very specific examples of words that actually create gravity. Courage That's right. is a word that is exemplified through the gravitational acts. It is absolutely, absolutely something that you're, you can feel. And part of the issue that I see w within our, our, our country is that these words have lost meaning because there's no there's no exemplifying acts unless right. they're guys that are out there that are constantly trying to measure the hard right over the easy wrong. That's right. In this influencer based society where we're just kind of awash in where it's superficial. It's, it's superficial. Bumps. It's right. it's materialistic. And by the way, I'm a capitalist, but I do think that there's there's a difference between uh, building a company and trying to reinvest in infrastructure and grow something that's going to become bigger than yourself and trying to grow a company so you can become individually wealthy. I'm not saying anything against wealthy people. I think that they're fantastic and amazing, but I'm a capitalist. I like investing in infrastructure and building. Well, Adam Smith things. was capitalism with a conscience. Very different. Yep. Like it's, you know, it's, it's profit with a purpose or however we want to define that. And I think for people, they need to have these examples of, and you know, Kennedy wrote the book Profiles and Courage. I think these are profiles that people have to be educated on. Absolutely. And more importantly, they have to have the desire to be educated. And I think that's where this, this woke conversation comes in and it starts to get really conflated as to what is courage, right? So like courage to me, I know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And like stepping up and putting your cleats on on a Sunday, that's your job. That's right. That's not courageous. 
Like, not at all. <laughs> so just so we all understand, like that's entertainment and, and it's tough and it's difficult. There's a difference between having a physical. It physically tests you. Physically, However, it is how, not true courage. No, right? no. And I think I see and I know of so many different people that has, have, have exemplified courage that we should be following based on they have repetitions in this and they've they have exemplified what it means. That's right. But typically, you're not going to find that uh, at your fingertips on on Instagram, and I definitely don't think that you're going to be finding that through, uh, you know, leftist uh, propaganda <laughs> through TikTok. So, <laughs> you know, we talked about it a little bit, and I failed to bring home the final point. I wanted to be an operator, right? That's what I wanted to be. I wanted to do things my way, and I realized it wasn't about me. And then I thought about the big picture. We talked earlier about what do you believe? Do you believe in religion? Do you believe in God? Absolutely. You can't go through this complicated of a life and see all those things and have been shot and blown up and been around so much chaos and not see those moments where it could have. It should have. It didn't. Over and over and over. And I look back and I see the lessons I had to learn. Like I I had to learn how to be broken, man. I, I did. I was, everything was physically easy. Everything happens in life for a purpose. I believe that. There are certain things that we have, we have, we have choice, right? Mm-hmm. But I was pretty hard headed. I'm a bit of a slow learner on things. We've, we've ascertained that in this conversation. And I had to learn to be broken. I had to learn to get help. People I didn't know raised my family up in the nonprofit mm-hmm. world when I was laying in a bed in Walter Reed. I didn't know if I was going to walk, run, jump. I didn't know mm-hmm. if I was going to wake up with a knee, no knee. What was going to happen? I just knew that the pain train I was on was done, and I knew that I had been at the tip of the spear, the top 1% of the 1% of the 1%, and that's all I wanted to do. But I got broken, and it's hard to be the broke guy. You learn a lot about yourself and others and fundamental values of so many things when you have to suck that up and be humble enough to get help, right? Well, yeah, what, what's, that, what's that advice or that conversation that, that you want to have with people – and when I say this, it's because, you know, obviously you've gone through well, a combination of, of really big physical injuries. Mm-hmm. So you have your your intact self and then you have the post-injury self. Like, what is that conversation you wish you would have had as far as, like, what were you thankful for? What have you learned from this experience? What have you what – you, what are the things you wish you would have been able to tell yourself? Yeah, to save myself some time perhaps. Yeah. Uh, and this is actually something I share with people. Bad things happen, right? We can't control that. Focus on what you can control. I, I can't focus what happens, what other people do, no matter how hard I try, right? I, I can't make you do what you want to do. Mm-hmm. I can't make anybody do what I want them to do physically, right? Like they, you can force them at gunpoint to do things, stuff like that, right? Like you can corroborate them into it, mm-hmm. but it's not the same thing, right? Things happen. I can't control that, but all I can control is what I do next, right? But this is where you have to be mentally strong and you have to do that work and that effort and grind it out and understand why you fought for these things. And you have to go back to the roots, just like I, my, my son called me out on the carpet, right? And Gabe, I know you're going to listen to this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to give you your props here, bud. Uh, where I was whining, right? And he asked me, what are you going to do about it? Man, it wasn't about me. It never was. Mm-hmm. You're in life. You're learning lessons. Be grateful you're alive. Understand all the things you've done, all the things you fought for, all the lessons you've learned, and apply them to this. You still have to have goals, dreams. It just may be a little bit different. Uh, You know, the Travis Mills Foundation uses a term called recalibrated. You're a recalibrated warrior, and that's all it is, man. If you lost a limb, you've been injured, life changes. That doesn't mean you're a lesser version of yourself. You're just recalibrated. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Find a way to take what happened and turn it into a strength because that's what we do, right? Apply that lesson learned and then figure out the path that went ahead. I wanted to keep trying to be a Green Beret and I was able to do it. You know, that opportunity was presented to me. They didn't give me the outcome. I had to earn it. That happened. And I'm, I'm extremely grateful for leaders. Here's another leadership thing that took the harassment and all of the side talk and all of the grumbling to let a one-legged Green Beret who was, you know, in his mid-30s, try to prove his point and say that it could be done. That took a lot of courage, moral courage and fiber to, to do that. 
would have been really easy just to say, nah, dude, stop. Don't embarrass yourself or the regiment. But they tried. You know, you can't focus on the loss, man. There is opportunity in every single thing presented to us. We just have to be quiet and humble enough to learn from it and apply it. I didn't dream of politics, but I can see now, looking back, all the things that I grew up and went through. I grew up in a trailer, raised by my grandparents. My mom was addicted to drugs when I was born, right? Those are things that many people just don't get beyond in life. I, my family lost our farm. Again, something that could have been catastrophic and you never move beyond. I joined the military after, frankly, you know, not doing well enough in college to really merit being there. And it could have been a dead end. I joined special forces. I got injured. I made the best of it. I wanted to be an operator, but I learned how to fail, how to get help. And I applied that to what came next. And I kept working. And then I stepped into the nonprofit sector and I realized that we have a voice and that we have the ability to change public opinion about who we are as the military, who we are in SOF, and frankly, change public opinion in a large sense. We called it the Breaking Bread Tour when I ran a bike across the country. Mm -hmm. I wanted to prove how much more we have in common than that which divides us. From you know uh, the, the, the West Coast all the way through Arizona and Texas into Louisiana, we broke bread, we, we fed people, and we saw how much we have in common. But I had to go see that for myself and apply those lessons to what came next. I kept trying and driving myself and pushing to be the very best I could. And if you're in the fight, it's amazing where it's going to end up, right? And, you know, don't, just don't quit, man. Stand up. My only real talent and skill in life is that I keep getting up. Mm -hmm. That's it. I'm not the strongest, the fastest, definitely not the smartest, didn't learn the quickest, but I keep getting up. And I'm being humble enough to apply those lessons and listen to what life's putting in front of me. And it's led me to a position where I can really make a difference in people's lives. And historically, people like who come from where I did don't do this. Mm -hmm. And it's not what I wanted to do. But if I could go back and tell myself all of those things, I would say, don't change a thing. You ended up where you're supposed to be exactly with the tools, the talent, and the skills you needed to accomplish this task. Don't self-select. Keep fighting through this and see what good you can do. Fight for things based on the moral compass and the values we espouse and what you believe in. And keep pushing through that. If our community and our tribe does that, can you imagine how much good is going to happen? Mm -hmm. If more people run businesses the way you run Black Rifle, if more politicians... <laughs> Uh, you know, more people are elected into politics. They're not politicians, they're leaders. Mm -hmm. Step in and they know, dude, I understand what I believe in. I'm helping make political decisions and push my state or this country down this path because I know what failed leadership looks like. I know the cost of failure. Imagine how much better off we're going to be when the 11 bang bang, right, <laughs> much like we're talking about here, is out there making policy. We're not going to go fight wars we don't need to fight. We're not going to spend money frivolously that we don't need to spend. We're not going to teach our children BS. You know, you want to talk about profiles and courage. Our nation learned the value of treating people equally, regardless of race, creed, color, gender, so fast in the history of nations. We did, but it wasn't fast enough. And there were things that we did as a nation that we could have done better, faster, and sooner. But we did it. We move beyond it. And if you look at some of the conversation now, and this is something that really bothers me, you have schools who under the auspice of, uh, of racial harmony are having segregated graduations. Mm -hmm. Can you believe that? I mean, it breaks my heart. It, it, it does. People fought for that, died for that. A nation exists because of these things. And now we're going back to that because of it's easy. We don't do things the easy way, right? We're America. We're going to do it the American way. We're going to work hard, and we're going to apply those things. You know, there's so much more we have in common, and how much melanin you have in your skin, what state you grew up in, none of that matters. It's the merit of a person's content of character that matters, and it's driving each other to get better. If we do those things, our nation is going to do amazing things now and into the future. And I think it starts with us. Yeah, it, it it's surprising to me, and I think like one of the points that, that 
you know, I, I won't talk about my opinion, but do you think do you think this is a organized information operation to a certain degree against uh, what I would say is the younger generation of Americans from foreign foes? So I, I do think there's involvement in this, right? Mm -hmm. the, the world is too connected for it not to be. Right. You know, misinformation is readily available. And let's just take a step back and listen, right? Mm -hmm. You know, use your ears, listen to the th sounds around you in the, in the environment. China is telling us what they believe, mm -hmm. right? They are on a new long march. They're marching towards world domination economically, societally, and if necessary, militaristically, right? They've said that. Our enemy, a nation who does not espouse the same values we do, is saying that out loud. And there are people in government that will tell you they don't really mean that. Mm -hmm. No, they, they actually do. Let's why talk do about you Russia. Think, Let's talk why about... Why do you think they say that? Like, why, why do you think... I guess my, my, my question is, is why do you think there's a portion of our political establishment that says that's not the case? Because they haven't done hard things, uh, frankly. When you've learned lessons the hard way and you've seen... When we were out chasing dirt herders, right, and, mm -hmm. and farmers... You know, praying and spraying guns at us. What was China doing in Afghanistan? Right. Buying mineral rights. Mm -hmm. They were out there with science and teams buying light rights to land for the Belt and Road Initiative. They're on a thousand year march. They are looking at the long game. And frankly, many people in our country are looking at the USA Today and worried more about what Kim Kardashian's doing than uh, what our GDP is, mm -hmm. right? We're focused on the wrong stuff, but it's because we have so much. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about it earlier. Poverty is is horrible, and I, I don't want anyone to, to live the way I did, and I don't want that in our country. But our base level of, uh, of life and what's normal here is so much greater than any other country. Go to Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan. Go down in the jungles in South America and see how people live. Man, it, it gets a lot, lot worse. Go to mm -hmm. Europe and go to the ghettos in, in Warsaw, right? Mm -hmm. Go to the ghettos in London. There are people who live without in a way that most people can't comprehend. We are so uniquely blessed as a nation, and we have so much going for us that it's easy to complain about little trivial things because we have nothing else that really drives it. There aren't bread lines, but if we keep screwing it up long enough, there will be. That can happen, that can happen here. Venezuela was a rich, rich, rich country, and look at it now. Mm -hmm. That happened over a generation. You know, Reagan had it right, man. 100%. We are never more than one generation away from the loss of freedom. Mm -hmm. I believe that. We've seen that. And we can't forget that. But if we elect the wrong people or we have the wrong leaders in society, that's on us. We have the ability. We have to choose to be a part of it. And I don't think every one of us in every team room should go run for politics. That's not it, right? Find what works for you. Find your way to give back. Maybe it's coaching sports. You don't think you can make a difference in one person's life coaching sports? Promise you, you can. Uh, go give back. Read the kids at school. Do something in your community to share the values that you have, something that's right for you, your time, and your family. And you know what? Don't guilt yourself into more. If you can do more, do more. If you can only give that much, then give that much. But you got to give something. You've got to keep serving, man. There is... As long as you're trying and you're in the fight, that's all we can ask of people. But we all have to keep pushing that because we understand what matters. Do you think, um, well, let me, let me phrase it like this. Look, I, I look at the national debt, right? So I think about the $34 trillion that yeah. we, we owe. And when we break that down into, I, I guess, what that looks like as far as work capacity, a relationship to GDP, like it starts to concern me. Um, does it concern politicians? Like, are they are they discussing this at great length? Are they concerned Some do. with it? Some do. Absolutely. I, I will tell you. You know what the average age of the farmer is in Florida? Fifty eight. You know what the average age of a tradesman is in Florida? Fifty seven. That's a big freaking problem. Yeah. Somewhere along the line, and you asked if this was nations. I would say that, yes, other nations have pushed rhetoric mm -hmm. that has driven us down paths, but I would say also different societal norms and different uh, concepts other than what got America to this point have also been embedded. We didn't lose individual freedoms overnight. We didn't wake up and all of a sudden we're here from where we were. It's happened slowly over time. It, it's been, 
a slow loss, mm. right? Those things matter. And yeah, absolutely. So how do we fix that? It's education. We have to get left of the issue. We have to rethink what's being taught. We don't need to separate people by gender, mm. by race, by creed, by color. We need to push people to be strong and resolute and build the economy. We told people you had to have a bachelor's, a master's, or a PhD to be successful. And we lost focus on the trades. And now in a state like Florida, we're running out of tradesmen because we can't get enough people in it to keep the industry growing. Where does that go? If we lose our farmers, we're dependent on South America, China, other countries. What do you think is going to happen here when they shut the food supply off? Mm -hmm. Right? It gets worse. We have to maintain that and we have to grow that next generation. So what do we do? You got to problem solve. And I'll tell you in the state of Florida, we are absolutely having these conversations and we're focused on how do we fill that gap? And it's something the military does, and I love that they, we, we do it this way if it's done right. It's gap analysis. Mm -hmm. What are the problems, you know, those five-meter targets, 50-meter targets, 100-meter targets that we have to start knocking down to make sure that our, our freedoms and our liberties continue to, uh, to, to manifest themselves? And we got to knock those down in order. Do you, think, do you think the country can actually come together in order to solve bigger problems uh, without a, a national crisis? Uh, yes, I do. But you can't continue to do the same thing and expect different results. Mm. You can't continue to elect the same kind of person and expect different results. There has to be some sort of shift. Either you're going to get people in there who have the audacity to do what's necessary, and that's still the biggest differentiator of success. You decided you're going to go build black rifle. I'm sure you had people tell you you were crazy, right? Every day. 100%, right? Yeah. But you did it. Mm -hmm. I had people tell me, dude, you were just retire, man. Don't embarrass yourself. <laughs> like you're done. Just give up. But I did it. I had people say, you're not from politics. You don't look like them, talk like them, think right. like them. But we did it. Don't self-select, man. Get in there. Get in the mix and keep pushing yourself. And when you do it, you're going to inspire somebody else to do it. You want to change the tide and bring our nation forward? Get out there. You know, I want to think, here's a good lesson I learned, right? I didn't know what to expect. Honestly, I, politics was a foreign language. I, I didn't want to do this to such a degree that I didn't focus on it. But I really got to the point fundamentally where I couldn't find any other way forward but to help be part of that change. And we were out knocking doors. We knocked 100,000 doors over about a five-month window with my team. That's a lot of doors. It's a lot of doors. It is. Yeah. We had people screaming at us from the other side who would scream just really nasty, vile things. And we would sit down and have a conversation with them over whatever they were mad about. And they would realize, well, you're not really that bad. You actually seem like a pretty decent person, right? And then we would talk more about things, and we'd find like, oh, you believe like I do on this, on this, and this, and this. And pretty soon, they realized we align on 90 to 95% of the things. And you know what they did? They took a sign, they voted for us, and then they go out and knock doors for you. Mm. You got to have those conversations. But you can't have those conversations if you're not in the game or you're not present. In whatever arena it's going to be in, imagine if everybody from our tribe goes out there and makes a difference in some facet in our community. How much we could get accomplished. You just got to inspire a couple people to make a difference a little bit at a time. And you can push this thing back, but that's how it happens. I hope and pray we don't have a cataclysmic event. We don't, I don't want that. You don't want that. No. No, I just, I just sometimes wonder... Like how we're going to get our shit together without a unifying mission. And then in order to unify countries, typically, I mean, we can look at the last 100 years, right? You've had, uh, we'll call it the, the last 100 years, and we'll go back to World War One. So World War One, Great Depression, World War II, mm -hmm. like, you know, those are really galvanizing events. And then, you know, we'll look at Vietnam, which I, I would say was galvanizing and then ultimately separating as uh, for mm -hmm. for a certain amount of uh, for a certain amount of time, and then you had you know G Watt essentially. That's right. uh, but I look at the strength of the nation when we're pulling together, and then I look at the chaotic and confusing circumstances of the nation when we're when we're not. Mm -hmm. um, and then I look at how easy it is for our uh, you know China and Russia specifically to take advantage of of. Uh, of us in that circumstance. So 
Like for me, I look at it, I'm like, how, I, I look at our $34 trillion debt. And I'm like, okay, but why are we not talking about this like every day? This is a huge vulnerability. It, it Absolutely. Makes, it's, it's a huge vulnerability specifically within national security. If we look at what the debt's going to actually cost us over the next decade, it, we're going to be spending more on the debt service than we are defense, right. which typically as we start to look at uh, nations that do that. Where you have Wayne. Doesn't go very well. That's right. Doesn't go very well. So we're, we're, we're forfeiting leverage, which is national security leverage and economic leverage, and we're trading that for what I think are, are, are sound, stable, hard decisions that have to be made today. And I think it's equally, I don't, I don't know, I necessarily know if it's, it's, if, it's, um, if it's disproportionate to one party or the other. I think the conservatives have some of their things that they're sure. attached to that cost a lot of money. And I think that you have liberals that are attached to certain things that cost a lot of money. And at the end of the day, I just don't know if we can afford them. Like, I, I don't know. I, I'm asking you because yeah. you're no, in the game. No, I, I agree with you. So look, let's, let's look at something that in its just its basic premise is something that both the left and the right have failed on. Let's talk about the border and immigration. Yeah. We have to discuss immigration. This is a nasty, difficult economic reality that the left and the right have both failed the nation on. End of story. It's that simple. It is a math problem on people. It's a math problem on economy and support mechanisms and all of those things, but we've got to talk about it. So, I like to learn lessons. You know, I perhaps am more of a deep thinker than a fast thinker on some of these things. Um, and, you know, whether you agree with what Matt Gates and his eight people did or you don't, what was the lesson we learned from them? Eight people shut down our government. Mm. Eight people shut down our government for a specific reason. And we spent weeks going through that process. What do you suppose can happen if you have 25 people who are focused and resolute on being facilitative of the right shift and change to push our country down that path? What happens when you get 50? That fulcrum of power goes away from the DC elites and people who are career politicians into people like us who have built things and bled for things who get what really matters. If eight people can do that, what can 20 of us do in the right position? What can they do in that community? You want to know how I know it can happen because we've seen it. We just have to apply that logic and get the right people in those positions to facilitate it. And when you're there, it goes back to duty and it goes back to courage. You're not going to be courageous every time. Sometimes you're going to, you're going to suck, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to, you're going to be a turtle. You're going to pop your head down a little bit lower than you should. And you're not going to see the whole picture, but more often than not, as you do this, you're going to stand your ground and you're going to stand against the flow and you're going to be courageous because you got people next to you and you're fighting back for what matters. That's how this changes without a cataclysmic event. Mm. But that's a pretty robust thought when you think about what we're looking for. But it takes how many of us are going to have to step into the right. mix on these areas to get 25 or 50 people up at that level where we can push that change, mm -hmm. right? If we lead. Yeah. What Do you think... I, my question for like the border security before we get too far off that is, do you think that part of this from the left is that they want an open border with no voter identification so they can essentially buy votes through favor? Like, do you think that's a huge percentage so of the way I think there's thinking? some of that. I think there's well-intentioned people who uh. don't understand the consequences of what they're talking about because mm -hmm. they've never done hard things. They've never been and seen the reality of socialism. Mm -hmm. They think that legislating outcome is the most fair thing to do. But when you take away the ability to work and sweat and perform better than your peers, why are you not going to let people be rewarded disproportionately for that? Mm -hmm. That's what got our country where it's at. I think in many regards a lot of the decisions that have been made poorly on the left and the right, a lot of times are well-intentioned people who just don't understand the consequences or the reality of what they're trying to accomplish. We've elected the wrong type of person. Do I think that there are folks who want an open border to win votes? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I do think there are folks out there. And uh, I don't know the, the percentages. I'm not right. even going to yeah, yeah. submit or, or pause right. that out there for public opinion. But I do know that there are well-intentioned people who do things for the right reasons with the wrong cause and the wrong effect. 
and that we have to have people who have been honed in combat or honed in hard things in life to help make better choices. Yeah, I would, I would tend to agree. I think that, well, I think one strong border security is just the, the responsibility of the country. I mean, like what it's countries my, don't have a strong border? I don't know. How many I countries have you visited? <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know what, 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 what planet. And I mean, honestly, what country some of these people are speaking from, because there's no, there, there, there's no country of example that they can cite where this this works for the long term economic and That's national right. security. They, it That's just right. it doesn't. So, having an, a system to to process immigrants is always what, what. Well, I think if we just look at the last, uh, we'll, we'll say modern modern world, everybody has the system. Everybody. That's right. And if you don't, that means you're typically in the developing developing world and that's because you don't have the resources or the economic power or the security apparatus to enforce it and that doesn't really go well there's no cited example that i can that i can reference in modern history where this actually goes well i don't so i just struggle with the logic like why are we well a good one would be the, the 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 thought that we don't need some type of identification to vote but and I don't understand that. So, what are the reasons they give us for why it's wrong to have an ID? <laughs> right. I have to have an ID just like driving down the road. So right. you have to have an like, ID to buy guys, to use a credit having card. Having an ID isn't racist. It's not in the slightest thing. It's not sex driven, race driven, or creed driven. It's just the reality, right? That's how we do things. That's how civilized countries do it. That's what America does. To have those conversations and to take everything down to a, a race issue or a gender issue or a sex issue, it dumps down and it's lost on people. But, you know, we talked about this earlier. There's a lot of folks who are looking at 15-second sound bites, and that's all they hear. Yeah. They don't vet it. They don't research it. They just take it at face value. And if a politician who's elected, well, it's got to be trustworthy, right? He says it's racist, it's racist. Mm. But you never really do your own research and you see the reality of what they're talking about. You know, that's why having those hard conversations when you're out knocking doors mattered. No, I didn't want to talk to people screaming at us, and I didn't want that around my kids. But we're there. The thing already happened. They're already yelling at us. You may as well have a conversation and see where it can go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, let's talk about border security. Absolutely. You're going to have to build a wall. I think you have to have immigration reform and conversations on that subject because it's a math problem. You know, you can't let everybody in in an open border standpoint Point, from an open border standpoint and expect our economy and everything else to work out the same way. Right. When you have less people doing and creating and more people receiving, how does this work out? You cede power to the government and what's beautiful about a republic mm-hmm. is you have the minority and the majority protected from each other, but they're both protected from the government mm-hmm. in our, our manner of, of life and government here. They made this for a reason. It was pretty well thought out at the, at the foundation of our, of our country. Yeah, it, it, Going to that, have you spent a lot of time? Uh, do you spend a lot of time reading? Do you like w- as much what do as you, I can? What do you what, what what have you read in the past that has inspired you? Like like from a, a political perspective, have you gone through the the Federalist Papers? Have you gone through some of what I would say the constitutional the history? documents? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah all, all the above. I think uh, Adam Smith. It is not an exciting read. Mm-hmm. It's something we should read about the economic model of what mm-hmm. we're doing. Uh, the foundational papers of, of our nation. Listen to what Thomas Jefferson was mm-hmm. thinking about, what Washington was thinking about, even in something as benign as their personal thoughts, right? Those things mattered. Mm-hmm. You know, people expect that, oh, they were great leaders. They made a country. They were people who did great things. You know, Ronald Reagan, they used to call him the great communicator, but he would refute that and say, I, I'm not a great communicator. I'm just communicating great things. That's so true. Mm. But if you don't understand at the foundational level what made our nation unique, what we stood for, you know, where we made our mistakes, you know, that's why we can't hide from our history. Guys, we've made mistakes, but we have to own it. The first thing you learn in, in our arena is that if you make a mistake, own it, man. There's no shame in making a mistake, but there is Everybody a lot of shame it. in not learning from mm-hmm. it and not sharing that with the people yeah. around you. We can't hide from history. Nobody wants to, period but you can't hide it from the world and expect that it didn't exist because you're going to get to a point where people are going to have to relearn those same lessons over and over and over again. And that's how Rome falls. Mm -hmm. That's how our country falls. 
And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's just that simple. Absolutely. I read things from the foundational documents uh, of our nation, you know, to uh, stories. Yeah, uh, what, do you, what do you read for, for news? Like, what do you, what are you reading now for news? Like, who do you tune into? Like, what, what are yeah, you reading? A little bit of everything, actually. Really? I, I use a little bit of everyone. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll listen to traditional left, uh, traditional right. Uh, BBC, oh, honestly, uh, is a good source. Yeah. Uh, they'll listen to things like Al Jazeera. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you get a whole different approach, and you have to differentiate the truth on that. I think what's hard now is we have to get outside the Twitter space, Facebook, yeah, yeah. Instagram. There's so much information out there. And, you know, we talked about it a little bit earlier. That's not real life, man. Mm. People are neck deep in in just talking and making noise and not solving really complicated problems. None of those are the things that are problematic right now. They're not. You know, look at The Economist. Let's listen to deep thinkers who are trying to solve real issues in our economy. How do we stage things academically to provide choice and opportunity to everybody, regardless of race, creed, color, gender, background, so they can grow into the best version of themselves? How do we talk about academic reform where you give all that opportunity without bankrupting your state or your country? Those are the things that make a difference. I don't care about what goes on on Twitter, mm-hmm. on Facebook, and Instagram. I just don't. It's it's, it's relevant as a as a communication device. It, it I is. mean, it obviously is. But I think, you know, one of the things that I've I've been trying to get more into is uh, people need to have a more objective and refined look at different at different topics. They need to be able to go deep in and and listen to somebody. So, you know, for instance, outside of, um, or inside your ecosystem, like who are you communicating with? Who are some of your politicians that you really like to follow or that you think are kind of or beating the drum of, of political logic? So, you know, honestly, this has been interesting. Stepping into this realm, I reached out to people who I knew, right? Mm-hmm. Mike Waltz, uh, Brian Mast were two of the first ones I talked to. I met uh, Crenshaw yeah. and had some conversations with him about, like, what are you thinking? How does this work? And, you know, he gave me advice. He's like, read, man. Just read. Don't listen to the rhetoric. Focus on what you know and keep abreast of what's going on and solve problems, right? Mm-hmm. And don't be afraid to stand by yourself if necessary and do what has to be done. Uh, I do talk to those folks. I talk to folks on both sides of the aisle. You know, uh, in Florida, we have a couple of folks who are very, very intelligent, very focused and driven, and they'll give you their opinions. We don't agree on everything, but you need to listen because it challenges me and it challenges my mindset to grow just a little bit better. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm not going to throw out names. I'm not going to get down that path. But you've got to listen to both sides on this. Um, You know, I think in listening, uh, I've watched a lot of what Governor DeSantis Mm-hmm. talks about. He fundamentally understands at a very functional level how it works. There's a lot of common sense, and he is not an inch deep. He is a mile deep on almost every single subject. It's really amazing when you hear him talk about subjects over and over and over again. I've learned a lot just hearing him. Uh, y- you've got to. Mm-hmm. I think um, you know. a lot of times we hear what they want us to hear from the NRCC or from this senator or that congressman, dig a little deeper, get in there, but you also got to listen to the public. When they come testify federally, what are they saying, man? Like I, I have dozens and hundreds and even, if not thousands of people come through our office every month, right, in certain cases, talking about things. Highlight what they're saying. Hear their voice. This is the people who elected you. They're there, and if you're humble enough to listen and take the time to apply that logic – you can really do some good. So it's good to be aspirational and hear what big thought thinkers are, are talking about. But we got to listen to the plumbers and the farmers and the business owners and the moms and dads and students. You want unvarnished truth, man, talk to an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old. <laughs> yeah. He's going to tell you really quick, like, that guy sucks. I don't like him. Yeah. And children are generally pretty accurate in their first assessment on those things, right? I think you've got to be, uh, it's that whole every man concept, right? You got to keep abreast of as much as you can, and it's uh, it's very much the reality of uh, of where we come from. Keep your hands in many many things, but that's what SF guys have done. We have tons of mission sets. We're involved in everything, and all of it's relevant. Yeah, I find 
the political conversations are, are uh, well, unless you get into like a really uh, deep and meaningful political <clears throat> conversation, they're really just kind of surface. Like yeah. there's a lot of sound bites. Uh, there's a lot of talking points that are ultimately just kind of used in order to galvanize the the base on either side. But when you really want to get into the nuts and bolts of a of a policy, like those are the things that I'm I'm, I'm like, where do you go? Like where do you go? Like do you do you pick up the phone? Do you call? You know, do you call a bunch of different people. Like for you specifically, mm-hmm. I mean, you have access to information, but it, you're calling multiple people. Absolutely. I would imagine, right? So. Let's look at uh, the constitutional carry bill. That was my very first bill. Mm-hmm. Like I got elected, showed up. I didn't know where to park. Like, <laughs> where, do I, where do I park my truck, guys? Right, yeah. And then I had to show up and figure out like, how do I file a bill? Right. I, I listened to it. I know how bills work, but I didn't know how to mechanically file it. I had to learn all that. And then they're like, "Hey, you're a Green Beret. We like your approach. We want you to run this constitutional carry bill. Yeah. You know, I'm going to run it. It's my bill. Uh, this is what we've decided. And are you comfortable doing that? This is a big lift." Absolutely, man. Why would I not? Mm. You know, what we did in clawing back individual gun rights for the first time in 30 years in the state of Florida, it was pretty unique. Did I do a lot of research and talk to a lot of people? Absolutely. Like, that's a big stage. And there's a lot that can go wrong. And I'm trying to learn all of this at the same time while I'm doing this large moving bill that on its just face value is going to upset some of the people and make some people happy. And then even more so than that, there's gonna be people from my own party who doesn't don't think it goes far enough. So right. you may not make anybody happy on this. I talked to people on the left. Uh, we sat and we talked through their thoughts and their views and what they were concerned about. And we looked at statistics. We talked to policy institutes on both sides. I talked to staff uh, from, uh, from uh, our state. I talked to staff from other states. I talked to citizens from probably a hundred different groups who came in and I got their thoughts on this. You know, if I couldn't meet with them, my staff met with them and they took the notes and they passed it on to me. Right. All of those are thought processes involved in just this one bill. Absolutely. And then you have to do your own research. You get all those things. And then what are the actual ground truths of what we're talking about here? Are we making our community safer, uh, less safe? Is there a more, more of a risk? And, you know, I, obviously the bill passed. It, uh, that's what I fundamentally believe. I believe in inalienable rights, and I believe it makes our community safer in the long run to have a well-armed citizenry. Uh, but we've got to hold people accountable. That's my fundamental beliefs. But there are people who don't agree with it, and that's okay. They're not wrong for their belief. I don't agree with them, but they are entitled to it, and that's what we fought for, and that's what makes our system of government better. Mm-hmm. If we all think alike, the republic's not going to work, man. Right. There's a check and a balance. It was built that way and purpose built for that exact thing. If everything goes easy and every bill flies through and sails through, you have groupthink. That never works out well. Not in business, not in life, not in sports, and certainly not in governing. So it's you've got to cast a wide net if you yeah. really want to do the right thing. I, I've wondered this, and I've asked this question. I've been very critical of... Uh, general officers on this podcast. Do you see a lot of them being involved in uh, what I would say is, is uh, policy in public life in uh, making a difference specifically in, in GWAT veterans today? Do you see? So I see a few. Yeah. Uh, there's some good ones mm-hmm. who I think get out there and get in the mix. And frankly, you knew the difference when you served with them, right? Mm-hmm. They were the same ones who were out there working their tail off right next to their people. It wasn't about the rank. They just have more responsibility, right? They got blamed for more things when I went wrong. I think there's a few. You know, uh, do I think, I think where the disconnect comes is a lot of people outside of the military think that because you're a four star or two star or one star, well, the more senior the rank, the better the person for this role. So let's just go find that guy and put him in a position. Mm-hmm. And you end up not moving the ball in a lot of arenas. And I'm not gonna pick on them or, or say that none of them do this. Um, Oh, well, you don't have to. I, yeah, I'm just I, wondering, like, what's yeah. your thoughts? Like, yeah, it, it it appeared it appears to me that there was a, a more active participation from that peer group in previous wars. So, oh, after the fact, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, and this is something I've actually talked to several GOs about. I'm not going to name names on this, but 
they still think that they have to be apolitical because of the merit of their rank mm, okay. and what, they, what that means to the government. And I, I just I fund, fundamentally disagree on that. You know what's resolute, what's right, what's wrong. And I think you have to step in, not and put your finger on the scale, but do what you think is right. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, how many times we hear that in selection or in your career in training? Do what you think is right, operator, right? Get out there and do stuff and, and be present. But you can't just kind of sit vanilla on the sideline. Their ability and capability to do overwhelming good, imagine if you get some of those those people movers out there doing the right thing and rowing the boat that way. Yeah. You know, I, I think you see a few folks out there really trying to push the, the narrative on things. Um, hopefully they can drive some of their peers to do it more so. Yeah, I, w- I would love more people, like, from our community specifically to get involved. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, you know, I, I can name a few, right? So Morgan's, Morgan Luttrell, obviously, he's been involved. You have uh uh, Eli Crane, he's he's out yep. there, you know, and I think, I think there's been a there's been a lot of positive encouragement from the community for people to get involved. I think us specifically as a peer group, I think we're at an age and a time in which we have enough wisdom, and it, well, wisdom equates to kind of intelligence, experience, and yeah. and, and and it's and kind of convergence, yeah, <laughs> convergence of those things where you know we can be a value. Because I've seen it, like I've just seen a lot of yep. a lot of us kind of get more active in this. Are there are there groups that are promoting like Green so, Berets getting in politics and stuff? This is a much more complicated discussion. There are organizations out there run by mm-hmm. uh, we'll call them politicians mm-hmm. or you know political staff and, and folks in that arena that target military candidates just because they're military, right? Not everyone's the same. Right. Not every candidate is the same. Yeah. And you will see people who run out there that want to run for the wrong reasons, even from our community, right? Uh, less so in soft, perhaps. Definitely also in the military. And they don't care who they are. They're there to make money mm. and make a buck. And I didn't know my head from a hole in the ground politically. I made a lot of mistakes when I first jumped in here because I didn't know anybody. I literally picked up the phone and cold called people in the political arena in D.C., until I found someone who picked up my call, and then I talked to him, and I sold them. And I sold the next guy, and the next guy, and the next guy, and pretty soon, I'm doing interviews to build a team. And it's just like, you know, anything else. Now I'm selecting who I'm going to be working with and how it's going to work. And I didn't know enough of that, and there were enough people who I was getting advice from in some of these, these organizations that they weren't doing it for the right reason necessarily. Mm-hmm. They were doing it to get money through to pay, you know, people salaries perhaps and not really worried about the outcome. I think if you want something that works a certain way, you got to purpose build it. So that's where I think a, a lot of us are trying to move towards creating organizations that do just that, that target the right veteran with the right experiences. Uh, you select them for the right reasons. You provide insight and understanding of the environment, even the language, what to say, what not to say. How does this actually work? And then you help prepare them once they get into the, uh, you know, the, the political scrum. And that's really the best word. It is a scrum all day long, going to events from day till night, talking to people till you can't talk anymore, uh, running from event to event to event, never having a second in your life that's turned off. It's a lot to wrap your head around. Mm-hmm. You know, I had no clue on these things. You hear people talk about it, but until you actually have a conversation, you experience it, it's different. It really is. You have to prepare them and un- help them understand what they're getting ready to do. But then you also have to help them fundraise and teach them how to have those skills. I had to learn how to, to shoot, right? How to jump out of an airplane. Right. Those weren't skills that everybody can do the same way. Fundamentally, could I fundraise? Sure. But I didn't know what I was doing? Absolutely not. I hate asking people for help on anything, mm. let alone asking American citizens who work their tail off to donate money. It's horrible, but that's the reality of it. You know, I think we all agree that the cost of politics is a little off base. It shouldn't be what it is, but you can't change that game until you win the game and you get involved. Right. I just, I don't see any other functional path. And if we want that to happen, well, we got to start bringing people in that are going to help us do that. And we got to build that purpose, build it, to find, develop, support, 
train and employ the right veterans in this arena right from whatever if you want 25 or 50 resolute people you got to find them and prepare them because it's not easy yeah is there and there's is there anyone that you can think of that's doing that right now like no like, yeah there's groups who are starting to do it yeah you know um you have folks like uh, With Honor or mm-hmm. More Perfect Union. They're all talking around the periphery, and I think they're all working towards the same concept. But what I want to do is actually focus on a thing. Let's talk about, like, if I were you know king for a day and I had the money to go do what I wanted to do, I think you got to focus on local races. I think mm-hmm. you got to focus on school board, county yeah. commission, yeah. where the rubber meets the road, and you're growing candidates to step up to the state and step right. up to the federal level. Give them those base skills where, you know, if you bring in $50,000, that, that covers that race. Mm-hmm. But you have to teach them how to do this. What are those fundamental things? What are the pressure points, the trigger points? Where do you actually make a difference in the politics of it to step forward? We've got to start doing that. And I've not seen anybody doing that on a grand scale. I know there's a lot of folks talking about it. Um, I think you can change politics. Let's talk about all the information that's available on the Internet and using those and finding better ways to talk to more people, to be present, to sell yourself, to utilize a lot of the same tools that we're talking about with social media more to our advantage. I didn't talk about social media when I jumped in here. I, my Facebook was essentially for people to tag me and stuff and uh, for my wife to post pictures to and tag me, right? Like, right. that's it. It was, a, it was a log of our life. I didn't do anything on it. And now everything we do is out there on social media for the world to see but you got to prepare people for that mindset. Mm. And, you know, I think in time you'll see a lot more development of this as things go on. I know there are several groups around the country working towards that. I know Mike Waltz is talking about it a little bit. You know, we're talking about it. People from uh, the business community are talking about creating this. You yeah, almost like, have to. I like Mike. I like him a lot. I do too. Yeah. Mike's good people, man. Yeah, he is. He's a, he, he sat down with me a couple different times when I was out in D.C. the last time and, like, just a normal – Good, good human. Just a fucking great human. Yeah, he is. He, he's, yeah. he's still a guy you would want to serve with that <laughs> yeah, range, right? Seriously, yeah. Like, I walked into his office. He was, like, meeting with a bunch of dudes. And I, he was like, come on in, sit down. I was like, oh, okay. Right? Well, I'm a business guy. That's what I do, you know? Yeah. Like, he was, like, so kind, so cool. I hope that he gets out. We're doing the 80th anniversary jump in Normandy. So, like, if you're not doing anything, you can come out and jump I'm in. This. You're Love in? to. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Brother, I'm good. That's great. Yeah, that is, <laughs> you have not got to see me have a good time here. <laughs> like, I was in a jump street. So. Yeah, that's awesome. So if you were king for a day, mm-hmm. like let's say this is a magic wand, this stupid yep. blue, blue marker that my daughter left on my desk, <laughs> right? That's your, that's your king for a day magic wand. You had one policy thing that you could make. So your king, there's, there's so-called a king of America, so to speak. Mm. What's the one thing? Term limits. Term, term limits, limits, not just for the elected. Yeah. You got to term limit the people underneath them, or you've ceded power to the unelected officials and oh, bureaucrats yeah. for eternity. Right. And that's when the yeah. bourgeois becomes the power brokers right. and everything goes to hell in a hand grenade, right? Mm. But you got to have term limits. Our nation and our foundational, just the foundation of our government is predicated on people serving and having to go back and live in the reality they created. Peer pressure is a heck of a tool, right? If you screwed up, people to your left and right are going to hold you accountable because you're coming back to it. Right. We need more of that. And, you know, Florida, we have term limits at the state level. Does it make it hard? Sure, because you churn people in and out every eight years at the very, very most. A lot goes right, though, as well, Mm -hmm. right? Term limits change everything. But you got to term limit those unelected folks, yeah. or we're just. What's the point of an election? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting perspective. It's also an interesting point. Uh, greatest American president. Who? So you know, this is going to sound a little cliche, but yeah, I, I think you have to go back to Lincoln when mm-hmm. our nation was at its most vital stretch when the very fabric of what we stood for when people who fought in a revolution were being challenged with ideological differences he stood resolute now we can talk about what was his actual reason and all the politics of it but he stood resolute Mm -hmm. and we exist as a nation because he had the courage the commitment and frankly the candor to say what had to be said 
and speak great things. We exist there. I ain't. I, I don't have just one, sorry. Yeah, it's I, I, I love Ronald Reagan because mm-hmm. he understood the office is bigger than anybody. Did he always make the right decision? No, man, he's a, he's a human being. We mm-hmm. all screw up. But um, he made a difference because he communicated with, su- with such eloquence and intelligence, and he understood the value of what America stands for on the world stage. We stand for something, man. Go around the world. People understand from an academic standpoint what America is. You know, it, it really matters. Those are, I'm going to stop at that. I'll wax philosophical sure, yeah. about this for hours. But you, you, you got to love when our nation was being ripped apart, someone who stood for values and made hard decisions on the economy and leaned into the problem and stood resolute. Lincoln's my favorite. I actually have a print of the Gettysburg Address right. and pieces like that on my wall behind me to remind me of that. Uh, what about you? Well, I, I'm fairly easy. I mean, I think you know, Washington, uh, and because of because of obviously he's the first. Uh, I also think that he was probably the most important uh, figure. The man in, who could have been king. And uh, the man that could have completely unraveled what we have today. That's like, right. By making he could have made a series of, of decisions and and that would have been before the revolution uh during the revolution and after the revolution mm-hmm. that would have ultimately uh it it would have defined america in a completely different circumstance and more importantly it would have eliminated the opportunity for america to exist 100 percent. you know what's unique about both washington and lincoln not everything went right in their lives no. they learned from failure mm-hmm. and they got up and they tried again they got up day after day. Lincoln failed so many times at so many things. And he became arguably one of the greatest presidents in history. And I agree with you, Washington's in that that mantle, right? There's a reason he's you know encapsulated in a rock yeah. in, in <laughs> South Dakota, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it's, a, it's a pretty big deal. Yeah. But you know, if you think about the, just the arguments we have as a nation, mm-hmm. they're the same arguments that Washington, Madison, Jefferson, Hamilton, they're the same things. Mm-hmm. Big government, little government, mm-hmm. where does freedom lie? Where is the state's right versus the federal government's right? It's all the same conversation. And they had them then and built a nation after the Articles of Confederation, right? Yeah. That has tested time and changed philosophically how people look at government. I mean, what an amazing concept it really is just to understand how it came to be. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's truly amazing. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, out of modern uh, presidents that I think I'm, I'm most – I would say fascinated by, I think Eisenhower was, yeah. uh, I think he was an incredible president. I think uh, his, obviously his military <laughs> service is something that, that you know, most people recognize him for, but uh, I also think that he was, he was an incredibly humble uh, in a very, um, I think he was a, a, an incredible example of what the office could be from a man, from yeah. an individual perspective. I think Eisenhower also was one of those guys that was tested with so many difficult decisions. The weight and the burden of uh, the invasion, just alone, yep. of you know thinking about carrying uh, the uh, you know that invasion into Europe, and then balancing the figures that he had to balance in order right. to to succeed. Specifically, when you're thinking about not only the president at the time, but then you had Churchill and you had Stalin and you had all these different really big figures in history. And Eisenhower, I think he did an incredible job of not only balancing those, but then he had the internal, his, his internal military leadership from you know Montgomery to Patton to, oh my gosh. Oh my right. gosh. Yeah. So I think about Eisenhower a lot where the, the, the burden of leadership in modern history, I don't know if anyone has felt the full weight of leadership like Eisenhower did from, uh, obviously from World War II and then post-service and in, in, in office. I don't know if anyone's felt a bigger weight because then you, you had the follow-on effects of the Cold War. Uh, you had the, the, the unknown and the, the generational Cold War effect mm-hmm. of trying to understand what the Soviets wanted, what the impact the United States was going to be. Uh, I, there was so many different, very significant and 
what I would say is, is, is Atlas Shrugged defined from an individual figure and weight? Eisenhower was under an immense amount of pressure Absolutely. for his entire adult life. <laughs> and to bring this full circle, exactly why people who have been battle tested and learned hard lessons in hard places have to be a part of this process. Mm. When your moral compass has been resolute and defined under incalculable pressure, and to your point, I don't think you'll see anybody like Eisenhower. We don't go to war until it's done anymore. We go to war for a rotation, right? It, it's unfathomable now to most people to just think about deploying in the military and going to combat, let alone going with the invasion and not coming back until it was done. Until it's done. Right? Yeah. Four, five, six, what, whatever the cost is, mm -hmm. that's what he did. I mean, wow, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's amazing. But then to step into public service and lead our nation at a time when there was so much going on, you had the rise of, of communism, you had capitalism at its core, you had this shifting within the, the culture of America, and you had industry being built and based in our country. He was there for that, right? Mm -hmm. You just think about all the burdens and him stepping up, it, it, it hits all those right arenas, man. That's, that's a great answer, Evan. Yeah, I, he's he's a fascinating character in history. For sure. Yeah, I think he's uh, probably one of the most underrated, for sure. But I, I, I'm i fascinated by just, like I would say, leadership in general, just yep. like understanding it from uh, not only a political perspective, military perspective, a business perspective. Um, now I think the burden of leadership is... It, it, and it's it's the duty, and it's not the burden, but it can be both. Like it can be, it's the privilege of leadership, and at times that privilege uh, comes with a significant amount of duty, it and at weight. times it it is the burden. Like, it is. It's like okay, it is it is what we have to bear. Um, I mean, think about the invasion of D Day. You talked about nominating the 80th anniversary. Can you imagine the gravity of authorizing? D-Day, and the loss of American lives, of families that lost their dads and their husbands and entire lines of the future because the greater good for our nation was at stake, mm -hmm. the freedom of the world was at stake, and America had to lead, that is immeasurable. I mean, we talk about not wanting to offend people when we go to uh, Walmart, right? And we can't. <laughs> how, how do you make that decision? <laughs> how do you prepare people to have that? But again, it's stress inoculation. We have to get to a point in our nation, and this is where education shifts and job creation shifts, that we are inoculating them for what comes ahead. And back to that duty conversation, we have to prepare our kids, man. Mm -hmm. If they're going to have to go slay dragons, we better start giving them dragon slaying skills right now. Because yeah. I don't want them to fail, and I want them to have everything and so much more that we ever thought possible. But we can't fail them now. No, I think that's that's... That's like what we have to do is we individually and specifically the GWAT veteran peer group, right. they have to step up. That's it. Like they really do. And that's one of the things that I've, I've been critical of from the general officer's perspective, which is they got to step up. They've got to stop being apolitical. They've got to step into the political fray. They've got to not that's only right. step into the political fray, they have to step up for the, the community mm -hmm. Because they owe it, like what, what one of the things that, that I talk a lot about, and you know, I'm sure that you talk about it and, and think about it, is we have a couple million people that have served in these, in these wars over the last 20 years. The people that are, are permanently, physically, uh, emotionally, psychologically uh, damaged. Mm -hmm. And not only do they have to step in to make sure that we have the layers of, of health uh, support that are needed to take care of, of the war fighters. But then we also have an obligation, a moral obligation, to make sure that they're, they're put back into our country and then provided direction and purpose. And I'm not saying that the government has to do that. I'm saying we have to do that as a peer group. That's right. Where I think we could do a much better job of integrating people back into our, our society and then injecting them in places of value. And I think that what, what happens, and this is my personal perspective, is there's a, a perspective that when you're retired, it's 
they're just going to put you out to pasture, right? Here's your retirement check. Yeah. Go off right into the sunset, like, yeah, man. and and collect your check and be happy. Ah, I, I I don't think that's I don't think that's the right answer, man. Hundred percent, it's unequivocally wrong. We're failing ourselves. We're failing our tribe. And those who are coming up behind us, because they're going to have to make that fight now because we failed to do it. So I'm actually going to share something we're working on right now, if that's all right. Yeah, please. So we call it the Valor Package. What I want, 200,000 people get out of the DOD every single year in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty significant number, right? Not everyone's the same, but I want more veterans involved in everything. I believe that. So if we want them there, how do we set an environment where in Florida we call ourselves the most military-friendly state? We have to keep getting better, right? So what does that look like? I think you look at this from an inside out. Let's look at the bullseye first. You got to provide for those initial needs. How do we make sure they have enough money in their pocket, that they have adequate housing available, they have adequate jobs for their spouses, the schools are good enough, and all of those things, put money in the pockets of those guys first. That's that first dot, right? That's that first circle. Outside of that, how do we help them transition? This is where we can have hard conversations. You know, let's have that there. Let's give them those skills. Let's connect them to the community. Let's create concentric circles. Uh, I think it looks a lot like education. So one of the things we're testing out and building right now is nesting our ROTC with our veteran centers and university. We're doing this at USF and FSU right now so you can stack them vertically so we have the old with the new mm -hmm. to provide that mentorship and develop. And then let's geographically place those centers in the middle of our school. So now we're talking about veterans and issues and military at the core and it's a, it's a launching pad for more conversation, which really defines and grows our country. Beyond that, uh, you got to have jobs and facilitation. So how do we do that? 12, 14 years ago, we made a bet that if we outsourced a lot of jobs to China, we'd be rewarded with white collar jobs, more mm -hmm. tech jobs in the back end. That was a bad bet then. Mm -hmm. You know, Rubio has been screaming about this for a decade plus. Yep. And he's 100 percent right. But how do we organically create that? You want people who have the courage and audacity to step in and do things on their own, but you got to set the environment to draw them in and let them do their job and get to work. So we're creating hubs in the community to provide purpose for veterans, and it looks like things like IILP. Uh, this is a, uh, a gym, essentially, for adaptive athletics where we can build prosthetics, orthotics, things like that for veterans, but it also works with the community to create the same thing, but what it does that is allow veterans to redefine what's in the art of possible and lead with a purpose for folks they don't know in the community. It gives you that blending, help mm -hmm. overcome that public, you know, military divide that, that it really is is so, you know, it, it's it's there because again, we're not talking about it well enough. Mm -hmm. Let's create more of those around the state so we have more collaboration, more integration. Mm -hmm. And let's do that in other circles. So we're gonna look at behavioral health. We're gonna look at childcare. How can we how can we solve those problems for this? And then you have to get outside of that. Once we have them here, why can't we purposefully target using them the gaps in our economy? So one of the things that we're discussing and looking into is if I need dental techs in Florida, which we do. So if you're a dental tech, move to the state of Florida. We want you there. We have a great <laughs> opportunity yeah. for you. But why don't we go to the military, go out to Fort Sam and target people who are getting out of the military and set them up for that? Let's you know work with our, our uh, community colleges. Let's work with our universities and the job provider to create those skill bridge uh, initiatives for that six month paid internship to draw them in and fill that gap and help them grow in the state of Florida. Those are things we should be doing. Mm -hmm. And frankly, we should be doing those in all 50 states. My desired outcome is if we do all of those things right, by proxy of that, you're going to have more leadership in our state, more opportunity, and you're going to prevent, you're going to give veterans the opportunity to go get into politics, to get into local leadership, into business leadership, and be involved, mm -hmm. which is what we want, what I want. That's my end state. So if you build it to draw folks in, you're going to get your desired outcome as a proxy of, of that uh, that capability. That's what we're working on right now in the veterans arena. We're doing the initial stages of that in our Valor package. And, you know, one of the things we're working on right now is I would love to create a holographic monument that talks about the hero's voice in our Capitol complex. And it does exactly what you're talking about. It reminds people of those resolute things, people who did great things and made a difference. I believe we need to remember them, but not in granite, man. Let's remember them as who they are, right? what they look like, when they talked about it, when they were living. The world needs to see that. And our whole world is predicated on technology so let's use that as a tool to help us win this fight and, and communicate great things again. That's just a, a snippet 
yeah. of, of what we're starting to build in. And that's just one direction that we can really go in to target our veterans and their families and shift the tide of things in the state of Florida. I, I love it, man. I, um, what else, what else can you think of that you want to, that you want to cover that we haven't covered on this podcast because we got a wrap, yep. but I, I think it's been a fucking great conversation. No, it's been amazing. And like, you know, we I want to make sure that you get, you get some time to, to cover anything that you might, you might want to talk about. You know, Evan, we hit the big things. I wanted to mm-hmm. talk about nonprofits and mm-hmm. giving, you know, that's that public private partnership. The government doesn't have to force things. Mm -hmm. We don't have to legislate things like that. They exist, and our country has always done this. And you talk about the potential for good by having four stars out there leading or senior leaders lead in an arena. That's what that looks like. It's not always in public service. It's solving a problem through a new tool. Get involved and solve a problem and just see where it goes. Keep doing good things repeatedly, and it's amazing where you'll end up. the other piece I want to talk about is my what I call my stump, right? Yeah. I want to sit there and I want to draw more of us into leadership in all facets of the community. It's our responsibility. It is our duty. And if we, again, are willing to deploy to a country to defend freedoms mm-hmm. and fight beside people we don't know, why would we not do all that we can here? Those things matter. We can't fail. Mm-hmm. This truly is on us. Our generation, our history... And I think, you know, when we're gone and we're buried, what I want them to remember our generation for is not the GWAT. I want them to remember that when our nation was at a crumbling point, we got beaten down, hit hard, and we got honed under the heat and pressure of combat for two decades. And we came back and we rebuilt America bigger and better and actually followed through on those fundamental values that created this nation and we made America great. We led ourselves and our nation to prosperity and success for our children and the generations to come. That is what we should be focused on because we can do that. I believe in our tribe to do that. Amen. Uh, incredible podcast. Great guest. Thank you so Brother, much. Brother, thank you. It. We'll post his uh, links to all the social media where you can go out and support uh, this is Evan, Black Rifle Coffee. Thanks, Evan. Yeah, man.